Well, good morning, everyone. Be it morning, be it noon, be it afternoon, or even evening. These are new times, new times where we gather uh, on the internet to discuss uh, uh, topics of importance. My name is uh, Eyjólfur Gubbinsson. I'm the rector of the University of Akureyri, and I would have loved to welcome all of you uh, to our beautiful campus, which you can see here in the picture. Unfortunately, we are not able to come together, but uh, thankfully, technology can bring us all together. Bring us all together on this Arctic Cooperation webinar, uh, the Arctic Guardians Dialogue. The Arctic uh, is becoming uh, more and more of an international subject, becoming the essence of international communication. And as all of you know, as soon as we have communication between people, we need to be guarding this communication and understanding each, each other and how we are going to be able to communicate. And this is what our webinar today is all about. The University of Akureyri was founded back in 1987 and is the Icelandic university on the Arctic. We are located in the municipality of Akureyri in the northern part of Iceland. And with the surrounding communities that are part of our municipality, the Arctic Circle actually goes through our own community. As the island of Grimsey, which is part of our municipality, has the Arctic Circle uh, running through its northern part. So you are indeed, in one way or the other, no matter where you are sitting in the world, you are indeed now part of a dialogue that is located in the Arctic Circle. And the university has also uh, been a uh, pioneering institute uh, in terms of police studies, where we uh, were the institute that has been, uh, has been working with the National Police Commissioner of moving police education to university level. I think in the future, we'll have a lot more dialogue on education uh, in the, uh, with regard to uh, the security of the Arctic. And that education needs research and new approaches. This is why I welcome all of you uh, to this dialogue about how we can indeed connect better uh, in these important matters. Now, I won't have any further uh, to say here, and I would like to welcome the uh, Rear Admiral, Rear Admiral Georg, Georg Laurison, Director General of the Icelandic Coast Guard and Chair for the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. I will not have a long uh, introduction about uh, Georg. I remember him in his position as long as I can think back, but official numbers tell me that was back in 2004. Uh, he has a, a long-standing uh, uh, service with the public authorities here in Iceland, but has in the past uh, almost now 20 years, Georg, it's almost 20 years now, uh, been leading our Coast Guard. So I'm looking forward to your introduction words. Please go ahead, Georg Lars. Thank you, Eurus. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, six years ago, after several years of preparation, um, eight countries established the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. As decided before formal establishment, the forum aims to strengthen multilateral uh, cooperation and uh, coordination of Coast Guard activities between the Arctic Council's eight member states within the Arctic maritime domain. Every year, the member organization uh, leverages collective resources to help support and develop safe, secure, and environmentally responsible maritime activities in the Arctic and adjacent regions. Uh, when the Icelandic Coast Guard took over the chairmanship role in 2019, uh, one of our goals was to emphasize pollution prevention and environmental affairs. We have had a great support from the Environmental Agency of Iceland and others, and we generally hope that the work will continue. Uh, one of our missions during the Icelandic Coast Guard's uh, chairmanship was to organize a stimulating conference. After months of hard work, it's finally time to welcome you to the Arctic Guardians Dialogue. 
it would not have been possible without uh, the hard work from uh, people around the world. I particularly want to thank the Icelandic Arctic uh, Cooperation Network for hosting this conference, and the, of course, the University of Akureyri uh, for the cooperation and support in making this uh, conference possible. For that, I'm sincerely grateful. Um, it is enormously essential for the academic society and organizations like the Icelandic Coast Guard to exchange knowledge. That kind of cooperation creates a basis for greater collaboration in and, and uh, innovative work. All the Arctic countries got opportunities to nominate speakers for the conference. Uh, I'm excited to listen to the presenters who were selected to share their expertise and experience. Uh, today and tomorrow, you will hear, among other things, about cross-cultural communications, uh, women in maritime, and maritime environmental response. I'm grateful to the many experts who have come to share their knowledge this week. I also welcome the conference uh, guests who have joined us online. Uh, I'm sure you will have a fruitful and rewarding experience in the next two days. So uh, welcome and thank you. Thank you, uh, Rear Admiral Kirk, uh, for uh, uh, your kind words towards the pre presenters and uh, to the conference in general. And I indeed want to second uh, your thanks uh, to the Arctic, uh, Arctic uh, Icelandic Arctic uh, Co Cooperation Network uh, and to your own institution for uh, making this uh, this happen. Uh, next up is Andrew Paul Hill. Uh, he is an uh, assistant professor here at the University of Iceland. But we brought him over from the UK back in 2016 when we started our uh, police uh, training program here at the University of Akureyri uh, for the first time in Iceland at the university uh, level. Uh, uh, Dr. Andrew has an extensive experience in law enforcement uh, in Europe and within the within, uh, UK. And the university was very lucky to have him on board when we are building up uh, this program. And as all of us know, it, it, take, uh, long, it takes a long time to uh, build uh, uh, new habits and teach people to uh, communicate in new ways. So uh, we indeed uh, see this uh, dialogue that we will have here over the next two days as an important part of widening, widening uh, that dialogue about policing and uh, enforcement in general. So Andrew will be taking over the moderation from now on, and I wish you all a very fruitful conference. Uh, again, I wish I would, could have been able to join you all for a cup of coffee here at the, uh, at the uh, venue here in Aquadiri. But should we say, hopefully that will be next time. Andrew, over to you. Thank you so much, Rector. And, uh, Thank you and uh, welcome to everybody who has given up some of their really precious time to join us for this important two-day dialogue. So as Rector says, I'm Andrew Paul Hill. Uh, I prefer to be called Andy. And over the next 50 minutes or so, we're going to talk about effective communication and cross-cultural communication in a professional setting. But of course, many of the things I talk about will be equally valid and, and relevant to our personal lives, because of course, as professionals, we take off our uniform, we take off our masks when we go home, and then we are different people there. But some of the things I'm going to talk about this afternoon will be relevant both in the workplace and at home. So just a little background uh, uh, about me. Uh, as Rector says, I, I have never been and never worked for uh, the Coast Guard. Um, and that doesn't, I don't feel, put me at a huge disadvantage. But of course, there will be some issues and maybe some language that will get mixed up. And, and I apologize in advance. And I hope that you'll correct me on that. The... My background is such that I have been a frontline police officer, both with the military police in Northern Ireland on anti-terrorist duties uh, for many years, where I was involved in, 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 in conflict resolution between the, 
the military, the police and the community, different sides of the community, of course. I also served in Germany and this will show you how old I really am because I served in West Germany before the war came down, in fact, a decade before. So I spent my life uh, in both in the military police and with the civilian police, with the Thames Valley Police in, in the UK, where I spent most of my time as a, a traffic cop, as a motorway police officer, where I often came into contact with people who were um, committing offences, but equally where they were victims of incidents, including fatal road traffic collisions and dealing with families. And so communication for me has been part of my working life since the age of 16. And it continues because I'm now a university lecturer. Um, I have done that in the UK as well as now, fortunately, uh, here in the north of Iceland. And so that's my background. That's where I come from. I come from a practitioner base as opposed to a purely theoretical base. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you about this afternoon, we'll blend those two things together. Now, in a perfect world, in a non-COVID world, we'd all be together. We would be in a, um, in a, a, a room here and we would have breakout rooms and we would spend time in small groups and I would ask you to do different activities and tasks. But of course, COVID means that we can't do that and it wouldn't be safe and appropriate to even consider it. And I don't have 100% confidence in the technology. So I'm not gonna break you out into, into small rooms, but what I am gonna ask you to do is to participate. And I'll explain how I want you to participate on the way through. Now, of course, there will be concerns over language skills and people's um, ability to speak and express themselves clearly in English, but that's okay because you're amongst friends. So what I'm going to do now is share my screen with you and then run through how this afternoon is going to, to look with regards to my session. I'm hoping now that everybody can see the screen. So maybe a little interaction. I can see some thumbs up, please, for my opening PowerPoint slide. Excellent, fantastic. Well, I've got confirmation, which is good, which means that I'm not making assumptions and I will move forward. Okay. So as I say, welcome. It's really important to remember that, you know, communication has been at the heart of human interaction since the dawn of time, there are no records. We do know that communicating was, uh, um, was visible, um, you know, 10, 20, 30,000, maybe 40,000 years ago with the cave art, the first attempts at communication beyond themselves, maybe with the outside world, maybe with people who come after. But communication is central to all and everything we do as humans. And you know, Every aspect of our lives involves communication. Every aspect of our work involves communication because at the very heart of everything we do is a person, is a human being. And I know you could argue that, that cyber fraud and, and internet crime, but there's a person who's programmed that. And of course, often there will be a victim. There will be a person in distress who needs rescue or, or, or security and they will communicate. Maybe they'll use a technological system, but there is always a human being, a person at the heart of everything we do. Now, of course, I'm not a nautical person. So uh, as you'll see, wherever I use a slide uh, with an image, the image has to earn its place. And here, I was never quite sure which is port and which is starboard. And to be honest with you, I think I might print this out and just keep it with me when I go fishing in Eyjafjörður for uh, cod and, and had it. But that's useful to know. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you this afternoon to some models that are some models and theories that I think are really interesting and helpful for us as professional people. Some theories and models that help us to understand each other. And I just want to say one thing here about cross-cultural communication. It is very often and very common when we talk about cross-cultural communication that we focus on different languages on different ethnic groups, on different interpretations. For me, 
cross-cultural communication is much broader than that. And the, the approach I take this afternoon is not limited to nationality or ethnicity or religion or any other separation of, of people. For me this afternoon, I take out, I, I, I look at it in the broader sense. Um, and, and each institution, organization has its own culture. And I would argue that the Coast Guard in Iceland will have its own culture. And I would suspect that each vessel will have its own subculture. And I would think that that culture may mirror in some parts, but not totally, the culture on Coast Guard ships in other Arctic states. So culture is much more than ethnicity or gender or uh, religious background or nationality. It's much broader. And that's the, the approach I'm taking this afternoon. Culture is normal. It is absolutely normal for institutions, organizations, bodies, ships, whatever, to have their own particular culture. And how do we recognize that culture? Through shared meaning, through shared language, codes and, and abbreviations. And I'm just going to give you one example that uh, came to me as a teacher at a university in England. It is very common in the UK, unfortunately, for cars to be stolen by young people, to be driven around, to be raced around, and then either crashed, set fire to, or just abandoned, and the offenders run away. It is not usually to steal the car to keep. It is more common that the car, and the horrible term is joyriding. Now, of course, this joyriding often ends up with, with, with injury uh, to people, uh, both physical, uh, emotional, and, and um, financial, but also people get hurt. So everybody in the UK knows about taking vehicles without the owner consent, and it's called TWOC. It's the abbreviation that you see on a lot of the popular sitcoms on a lot of the popular um, um, uh, fly on the wall programs where they show, oh, there's another twocker, they've twocked, they've twocked. Well, twock has a common meaning within the culture of the police. But actually, we have to be really careful with generalizations and assumptions, because twock doesn't always mean taking a vehicle without the owner's consent. Because if a person goes into hospital as a result of an incident involving a car, maybe the car has been twocked. If you talk to a nurse or a doctor or some medical person and refer to the term twock, they may look at you in a strange way because to the police officer, it's obvious. It's the taking of the vehicle without the owner's consent. But to the nurse or the medic, it is try without catheter. Now, I'm not going to go into the fine detail of the differences between the two, but they're the same abbreviation, but they mean very, very different things. And that's because within the different cultures, even though they speak the same language, their cultural language and associations are very different. And so that's why this afternoon we're going to talk about the, the cross-cultural communication in its broadest sense. And that's just one example. And it's a true example as opposed to a made up one. So I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about a number of models. One of them is called Batari's Box. That's the first one we're going to start with. I'm going to move into then transactional analysis. And this is just an introduction to TA, which is really useful and can be very helpful. And I suspect not just in work, but in home uh, and, and social situations too. Because often you're in leadership management or positions of responsibility, it's important to know how you are inter interacting with your colleagues, with your senior managers and with your, your staff. And so we're gonna look at categories of intervention. I'm going to talk a little about uh, John Adair's work around action-centered leadership, because leadership is about communication, of course. I, I know you get that. I'm going to touch on conflict resolution. I'm going to introduce a model. And then we'll talk a little bit about responses to dominance. And if time allows, I've got an, an additional uh, model and a theory, which I think is hugely significant. And in the summary, I'm going to invite you to tell me how these things link together in terms of cross-cultural communication. So your task is not just to sit passively and listen to this old Englishman talking about communication. 
but to think about how these link together, how we get each of these things, how do they come together? How do these individual parts form a whole? And I'll be inviting you to comment um, uh, in the chat uh, uh, about that. So without further ado, let's get into our first model and theory of communication. So just remember, communication, the whole journey, we're still evolving. And, and just as we're about to start our first model, just think about this. A hundred years ago, the idea of having a, uh, a, a telephone was, was a rare old thing. 50 years ago, the idea of a mobile phone was science fiction. The idea of taking a picture with a phone was science fiction. What are we considering today as science fiction will be the norm in 20, 50, 100, 500 years time? What I believe will remain the same is that there will be a person. There will be a human. Yes, there might be artificial intelligence, but there'll be a person at the heart of it. A person will need to program. A person will need to set up the parameters. It'll be very interesting to see where we go in the next 50, 100 years. I have to say I'm very grateful that I don't have to teach by using carrier pigeon. Okay. So our first model is Batari's box. Now, I don't know if any of you are aware of this model already, and if you are, this will be a refresher. If you're not, I think you will probably recognize it without knowing the name. Now, it's very clear that communication is not just verbal. Communication is about the way we behave. It's not what you say always, it's how you say it. It's how you present. And as I say, this one is useful both at home and at work. And so Batari's box is all about my attitude. What are my feelings? What are my thoughts about the person I'm interacting with? Because my thoughts, my perception of them affects my attitude. It informs my attitude, my attitude towards others. Are they junior to me? Are they senior to me? Are they a drug user? Are they a victim of domestic abuse? What, what is my attitude towards them? Because our attitude, which is really our thoughts and maybe our facial expressions, will affect our behavior. My attitude will affect my behavior because we are creatures of habit and instinct. And we have, as professionals, to be aware of this constantly, that our attitudes towards something should not always be visible in our behaviors. Why is this important? Well, because my behavior will affect your attitude. The person we come into contact with, their attitude will be affected by our behavior. Not completely, not totally, but in many ways. And so your, so your behavior will affect their attitude. And of course, their attitude will affect their behavior. Well, actually, this is a cycle because it continues. So if we start <clears throat> with a negative attitude towards asylum seekers or towards drug smugglers or towards victims of domestic abuse, this will possibly very likely impact on our behavior towards them. And our behavior towards them will affect the way they feel about you and the situation and their attitude will affect their behavior. And their behavior, whether it be positive or negative, will affect your attitude. And the saying, you know, you reap what you sow is hugely significant here. At what point in our lives have, do we recognize this? At what point have we gone into a situation with a negative attitude? At what point have we allowed our feelings, thoughts, and ideas to be acted upon? And how has that been responded to by the person we're coming into contact with? So what we have to do as professionals, as adults, is recognize that we're actually in a Batari box situation, that our attitude may be affecting our behavior and that our behavior is affecting the attitude of another person. Because we will often see 
our behavior mirrored in the behavior of others and it's often down to but not always limited to the attitude that we go into a situation with and so we as intelligent adults should and as professionals should recognize that our attitude towards a particular situation is important and if we do hold negative views if we do ha have assumptions which are inappropriate or negative we must never allow ourselves to act on our prejudices or stereotypes why because as we know so often communication is much more than the spoken word it's what's in the face now of course at the moment you are probably seeing a little picture of me and a big picture of the slide you're not really getting to see my interaction i'm certainly not seeing yours now in a regular classroom i would be watching for your body language i would be watching for your facial expressions are you getting it are you not are you on board? Are you not? Are you angry? Are you relaxed? Are you distressed? Are you upset by what I'm saying? But we can't always get that. So we need to think about our attitude, especially when we're dealing with other communities, other cultures, other professional groups. Our attitude towards them, do we look down on them? Do we respect them? Do we look up to them? Will impact on our behavior. And of course, our behavior, our behavior will affect that person's attitude and their attitude will affect their behavior. And you've only got to look at the current case in the US courts around the, the, the death of uh, George Floyd to see how attitudes and behavior uh, amongst law enforcement can, can result in, in very negative outcomes, both in terms of individual, but also in terms of communities too. So again, if we were in a, a classroom situation when we were all together, I would be saying to you, well, think of an example of, of how this applies or where you recognize this in your personal or professional life. But I want you to do that without telling me. I want you to think about this. Does your attitude towards a particular person or situation affect your behavior in, a, in, in maybe a negative way? And how do you break this negative cycle? Well, what you do is you, you, you really have to change your attitude. Maybe you're tired, maybe you're stressed, maybe you're angry, maybe you don't like a particular group or a particular situation but as professional people we must modify our attitudes so that we behave in a professional way and hopefully and in many ways we will get a positive response back not all the time of course but hopefully we will so this is Batari's box my attitude my behavior really interesting to know what you think if this is a model you'd like to know more about my email will appear at the end and I'll share more resources with you but this is just a brief introduction. Batari's box, remember? I want you to show me at the end, in the discussion, in the chat, how all of these link together. Okay. So the most complex of the, uh, of the models I'm going to introduce this afternoon, I decided to do early whilst you're fresh and, and switched on and your coffee is probably still warm or tea is still warm. The caffeine is flowing nicely. Well, the second one I want to introduce you to, and it is a brief introduction, but it's hugely significant, is transactional analysis. This was originally thought of in terms of counselling and therapy, but it's moved beyond that now. And it's recognised in leadership in management and management and in professions as being an important model and theory. Now, of course, it was developed by Eric Byrne many, many decades ago. Actually, uh, I was alive uh, for the second part. And what Byrne suggests is that whenever we interact, engage, communicate with others, we are in a particular ego state. And what he, what he has um, suggested is that there are five ego states. Five ego states. And whenever we interact with others, we are usually in one of these ego states. So I am going to ask you to use the chat in a second. But before I do that, I'm just going to set out a little bit about the theory. Well, he describes two types of parent. Now, these don't, these don't mean that you are the parent. This is about you adopting that position, that stance, that 
perspective in your communication with another. And there's two types. There's the protector, the persecutor, the critical parent. That's not good enough. Go inside of your room. Get that sorted now. There's the caring parent or the nurturing parent. This is the one that says there, there. It's going to be okay. We'll sort this out. We'll get to the bottom of this. We'll work this together. The nurturing parent, the caring parent. And we can alternate between these states in the same communication, in the same activity, in the same meeting, in the same family situation. We can be the critical parent or the nurturing parent, depending on the situation we find ourselves in. But it's about being the critical parent or the nurturing parent. Are we there challenging, persecuting, talking down to people? Or are we the caring, supportive, nurturing parent? No, there is always going to be a time for both. But it's always important to know which ego state you're in at what point. Of course, there is two other uh, options. And in response to being a critical parent or, or, or facing a, a nurturing parent or a critical parent, we can maybe behave in a way that's what's known as the adapted child or the rebellious child, being submissive or vindictive or being the free child. Well, I don't care. I don't care what you say. I'll just do what I want. But the adapted child is one that responds to the persecution to the, the protector parent becomes either submissive or vindictive, but their behavior has been adapted from their interactions with the parent. And as I say, you've got this free child response whereby someone is, well, I don't care. I really don't give a anything about what you say or what you do. I'm going to do my own stuff anyway. Now, these ego states are really interesting, these four ego states, because we can recognize them in our interactions with others, but we can also see them in ourselves. But there's one further ego state, and that's the adult. That's the rational, thoughtful, respectful individual. And there's only one option here there are not there's not two sides to the adult there's just one side to the adult so you've got the critical parent who talks down to people you've got the nurturing parent who says they're there everything's going to be okay who rescues them always oh it's not your fault it will we'll sort it you've got the adapted child who or rebellious child you know who is either submissive and yes sir no sir i'm really sorry i, I won't do that again or becomes vindictive or on the other hand, you've got this free child, this, I don't care. I'll just do what I want. But we've got this adult state as well. So my question to you, and I would like you to use the chat if that's okay. And I would like you to tell me, based on this few minutes of interaction that I've had with you, which ego state do you think that I am in? In other words, an, a CP? for a critical parent, an NP for nurturing parent, a uh, nurturing parent, an AC for an adapted child, an FC for a free child, or A for adult. And I'd just like you just to pop some letters into the chat, please. Based on the way I've presented to you so far this afternoon, which ego state am I in when I'm teaching you? Interesting. Good. Yeah, good. Good. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Those people who are, those people who are, um, <laughs> thanks, Andrew. That's interesting. Yeah, good. Thank you. So, yeah, I, I don't want to put pressure on you, but, um, but I, I just, yeah, interesting. Good. So we're getting a, 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 a good range of, of responses here. Some the, the strongest response there appears to be nurturing parent. Um, adult is coming through. There's one says I'm free child, which is great. I like that. Um, I don't think I've been described as free child for a very long time, but that's excellent. So thank you so much. Thank you for, for, for just participating, for, for, for just dropping in a, a letter or two into the response. So where I aim to be is adult. 
where I aim to be is adult. But of course, you don't know me and I don't know you. And I know for some of you that English isn't your first, your second or even third language, a third, um, uh, first, second or third language. And on that basis, I am drifting towards nurturing parent and adult. And so both of those are about where I want to be in a situation like this. You don't know me, we don't have a relationship. For most of you, this is the first time we've come into contact and interacted. So nurturing parent and adult is good. And I love the idea of being a free child. So that's fantastic. So now I want you to think about, and again, no more interactions at the moment. There's no need for you to carry on, although I see a really interesting one on there. Let's think about the last interaction you had before you came to this meeting, this last, uh, before you came to these workshops, the, 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 the Guardian um, narrative. Your last interaction, was it with a colleague? Was it with a family member? Was it with a peer? Someone of equal status above or below you? Is it someone who is the, maybe the cleaner? Maybe it's someone who is the rector or the rear admiral? Which ego state were you in? Based on that limited information I've given you, and some of you will have lots of knowledge about this, much more than me probably. But which ego state were you in? Again, you don't have to comment on this. You don't have to put anything in the chat, but which ego state? I'm just interested for you to think about that for a moment. And where would you like to have been? Just a few moments to think about that. Where, where would you like to be? And as Gunnar has said on the, the chat, you know, start, you know, he started to think immediately about the way that the government has responded to COVID in their communication? Have they been nurturing parent or have they been critical parent? Or have they been adult? Yeah, it's really interesting. It's really interesting when you look not only at your own approach to communication and interaction with others, but also when we look at the communication of people in authority, people in positions of, of, of trust and responsibility. And how about in a hierarchical organization, in an organization which has ranks and a formal structure? Does the senior officer always have to be the critical parent and does the junior rank always have to be the adapted child, submissive. Well, I would argue, based on my time with the military and with the civilian police, which in total is over 30 years, I would argue that there are times when a critical parent is necessary. There will be times when you're in a crisis situation where it needs someone to give clear, direct, instruction. But that doesn't mean that that must be the default ego state. Because to be effective, and we'll talk more about this a little later on, when we look at John Adair's work, the adult is where we should be. I would like you to do this. Okay, it's late. Can you tell me why it's late? And what are you going to do about that? Rather than being the critical parent or constantly rescuing and saying, oh, it doesn't matter when it actually does. So even though we are in hierarchical organizations, institutions, even though we've got a very clear rank structure, there will be times, of course, when critical parent is acceptable and appropriate. But in the vast majority of times when we're not in conflict or crisis situations, adult is where we should aim to be. And when the person that you're interacting with is in the adult ego state as well, chances are we're gonna be on a winner. Chances are our communication is gonna be potentially very effective. However, uh, I apologize, uh, apologies, that wasn't supposed to happen at all. So let me just get rid of that, okay.
Okay, can I just check, please? Can you see at the basic level? Just somebody just give me a yes, great. Thank you very much. Indeed. I do apologize. I hyperlink all my presentations to additional information. So at the end of the, the session, if anybody would like more information uh, or like follow up details, then uh, there's um, pretty much every image is uh, hyperlinked and we can talk about that near the end. OK. So at the basic level, if we're going to look at the child, adult and, and, and parent or superego, uh, as it's often told, we, th we hear words, we can recognize words, you know, because it's not always possible to understand ego states. Well, if we think about I want, I need, you know, satisfy me and the critical parent, you know, you can't, you must not, it's not allowed. It, these are real quick ways of identifying the ego state of another person. And what we have to do as an adult is to try not to get into complementary uh, responses, complementary ego states and response. If someone comes to you as a as a uh, as an adapted child, it is really easy to go into nurturing um, or parent. It is really easy to get sucked into this cross communication which is complementary in terms of you go from child to adult adult to child that is not where we want to be as professional people and we certainly don't want to be there as intelligent adults and that's because it's dangerous and it reinforces negativity if someone behaves as a critical parent and you get the response of a free child or even as an adapted child what you haven't got is an equal relationship an equal communication uh, appro approach to communication and that's dangerous if people assume particular roles it's dangerous what you're aiming for all the time is awareness first of all what ego state am i in secondly what ego state is the other person in. And what we've got to do as professional intelligent adults is try to get to the point where we're all in adult. Easier said than done. Absolutely easier said than done. But ego states, if we understand that someone is coming to us as a free child or as an adapted child or as a as a as a, um, a critical parent, what we have got to do is to respond as adult and hopefully with attitudes and behaviors appropriate for the situation, we should try to aim to get the conversation, the communication adult to adult. And this takes practice. The first thing though is awareness. You've got to recognize, you've got to recognize the ego state in which people are in. So that's the second model, transaction analysis, a brief introduction, but hugely important for us as professional adults. What ego state am I in? What's my attitude to this situation? If they're in a critical parent, how do I get them into adult? And the way we often do that is by being respectful, being courteous and clear in what we're saying, what we're asking and not making judgments and criticizing. That's the way forward and TA can help us with that. But there's another model and we're only 20 minutes left, but we've got plenty of time to cover these because these are much briefer than the first two. I apologize. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, that's not what I wanted. That's what I wanted. Okay, so the third model, the third model I wanted to introduce you introduce you to is Heron's six categories of intervention. There will be times as adults, as parents, as teachers, as leaders, as supervisors, that you have to intervene into other people's actions, activities, and development. And there are many ways you can do this, but Heron came up with six categories. And they're important that we understand these categories because they can help us to help others. And he defines them into two categories, facilitative and authoritative. One is from an equal 
helpful perspective. The other one is a power perspective. That's oversimplification, I appreciate. But these are the two perspectives. And what he talks about in terms of facilitation is helping to develop others, helping in their communication, helping them to mature rather than being critical of them. And so he talks about three facilitative approaches to interventions with others. And the first one is cathartic. And again, the examples on the screen speak for themselves. But if someone is really struggling with their work, you allow them time to express their thoughts and feelings. And this isn't all pink and fluffy and new agey, let's sit around the campfire and sing songs. But actually, this is about, you know, what's going on for someone? How are they feeling about this situation? Now, in a crisis, that's not the right time and the right approach. But most of the time, when we're not in a crisis situation, it's helpful for us to understand other people's thoughts and feelings and to help them to tackle them. A catalytic intervention is, is where we, as the person in authority or the leader or the adult in the group, is catalytic. We, we provide support. We help to shape, we act as a catalyst, we, we throw in questions. Well, have you thought about doing this? What impact might this have? A catalytic approach, as Heron says, is the most popular, most common, most useful, I think, um, in, in everyday uh, work situations. We interact, we intervene in someone's activities, in their, their professional work, in, in their, in their um, learning, in a catalytic way, we ask questions which help them on their journey of discovery. And of course, supportive, and, and this is very common, it focuses on building confidence with the individual, where someone who maybe is new to an institution or an organization or is new to an environment, confidence is key. And confidence in communication comes from a supportive environment. And if we link it back into the previous slide, the previous model, this is where the supportive parent and adult come into play. So cathartic interventions, catalytic interventions, and supportive interventions are all facilitative. The idea is to help the person to move on, to develop, to understand. And this is all about our communication with people. On the other side, there's the authoritative side, the power side or the, 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 the rank uh, perspective. And you can offer uh, a prescriptive uh, intervention. You can say to someone <laughs> directly, as it says here, no, we're not doing it that way because. Yes, that's a good idea, do this because. We are prescribing what they do and how they do it. When someone speaks inappropriately, we tell them so. We are telling them. And this isn't always the best way of learning, of course. We know that cathartic, catalytic and supportive is, is, are much more powerful ways of, of learning. Um, but sometimes we need to be prescriptive. Another one, of course, is to be informative, sharing and passing on information and confronting. Sometimes it is necessary to challenge and to confront attitudes, behavior and language. And Confronting a situation is harder than it sounds, especially when you're dealing with people that you know, you've grown up with, you've, learnt, you've worked with for a long time, or when they're in a position of power, when they're in a position of authority, especially over you. So if you're going to intervene with another person, if you're going to interact with another person, and you are in a position of either authority or control, or they're in a position of authority and control, but you need to interact with them, then maybe it's useful to know which of these categories of intervention you're, you're using or going to use and consider which one would be the most appropriate in the circumstances. Heron's six categories of intervention can be a very powerful tool, not only for leaders, but also for those who are led by others. The fourth model is John Adair's uh, action-centered leadership model. Now, I suspect that many of you are familiar with the work of John Adair. Uh, he was one of the first professors of leadership uh, on the planet and his work has stood the test of time. And, and this is helpful in communication because he talks about the individual, the team and the task. And it's right that they use these three overlapping circles because if one becomes more important than the other, 
then it's not an effective team. However well they communicate, there must always be some balance. I'll give you an example. Some people came to this session late. I am the individual, but of course, each of you is an individual. We have a team that has set up these workshops and, and this event. And we have the task, which is to share information within a time frame. What I have not done is allowed myself to use too much time or to, to, to end really short of time. But equally, those people who've come in late, what I've not done is given them priority by going back and revisiting what we've already done because I'm thinking of the team in the task. And so always when we are involved in activities with others, especially in positions of authority or in professions, we should always think about it from three perspectives. The needs of the individual, the needs of the team and the task that needs to be completed. And they should roughly be in balance. Now, of course, in a conflict situation, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a crisis situation, of course, often the task will come first. But generally speaking, the task and the team and the individual, if each are given equal weighting, if we take into consideration the needs of the individual by being fair and consistent through help with uh, helpful uh, feedback, um, we can we can empower the individual to be part of a, a, a of a team. And of course, if we understand our role in the team and what the team is trying to achieve, we can build the 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 individual, enhance the individual status build a, a stronger, better team. Of course, we can't always do that. We're sometimes forced to work together. But if we understand the perimeter, parameters, if we understand the culture of, of the team and the expectations, and we know what the task is and it's clearly defined and we've got time for planning and, and controlling the quality, then what John Adair says is that in balance, this can enable effective working, but it requires effective communication. It requires us to work respectfully and for the mutual task of achieving, sorry, a mutual aim of achieving the task. And we do that by working in teams. And of course, in Coast Guard, in policing, and in many other professional university, we work in teams. So team working is hugely important. And John Adair's action-centered leadership reminds us that it's more than just the needs of the individual. It's more than just the task in most situations. It's about balancing the three, and we do that through effective communication. But things go wrong. To be really honest, things go wrong. Things don't always work out the way they should. People get into difficulty. People don't do what they're supposed to do. People come to us and present difficulties. How do we deal with that? Well, there are many ways. Sometimes we go from the power perspective. When you are in a hierarchical organization, you can do that. You can go in from power. But actually, if you want to be really effective in dealing with conflict, well, there is a model that helps us. And of course, it's a model, so it's a theory, it's an idea. But I've used this many, many times um, over the last 20 years. I've got it wrong sometimes. I've got it wrong in the last couple of years, but I've tried really hard to follow the model and it can be effective. And what CUDSA does is, is offers a five stage process. And it starts with confronting the conflict. Excuse me. It's easier to avoid it, to walk away. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. But Sometimes as a leader, as a manager, sometimes as a subordinate, you have to confront a situation or a person. And I don't mean going in there with a baseball bat with nails sticking out of it and threatening them, but I mean confronting, challenging, stepping up and saying, no, this isn't acceptable. And part of the process of applying the Kutzer model to conflict, usually interpersonal conflict rather than between states, although the model applies equally as well, is that we first of all have to confront it. And that doesn't mean going banging on the door and threatening the person, but it means probably sitting down with them and listening to them and trying to get them to listen to you. Because what you've got to try and do as the professional 
is to understand the other person's perspective. What is it about this situation that's making them behave the way they are or to feel the way they are, to be in conflict? And this is really hard for some of us to do sometimes, but I'll give you an example of how this was used. In Northern Ireland, as you know, I served there for many years during the Troubles. Um, a very intelligent military man from Canada, I think his name was Mitchell, I'm certain his name was Mitchell. What he did is this, this, this conflict has been going on since before 1690. What he did is he got the leaders of the communities together and he took them away from their communities and he took them to a house for a weekend and didn't allow them to talk about anything that related to politics or religion, but just to talk about family and hobbies and social interests. And he got them to sit together and to learn that the other person wasn't an enemy, it was just a fellow human being with a different perspective, with a different view, with a different upbringing, with a different view of the world. And what he got them to do was to understand each other's positions. And that led, of course, to the eventually to the Good Friday Agreement. Lots of other work happened, but it, it helped to res resolve what had been a 30 year period of, of troubles where many people, including friends of mine, were, were killed. Try as hard as it might be to understand the other's position. And then define with that person, define what the problem is, not not the the effects of it, but what is the actual problem? Get to the root of the problem. And that means effective communication. It means being in the adult ego state. It means thinking about your attitude and, and how that affects your behavior in that interaction with the person. And with them, you search for and evaluate alternative solutions, come up with a range of options rather than imposing an option. This all links into procedural justice, which time doesn't allow us to talk about today, but it's a theory and a practice which is growing, uh, gaining momentum around the world. Procedural justice is about treating procedural fairness. Procedural justice is about treating people with dignity and respect, no matter their status. And once you've worked through and sought out and evaluate alternative solutions, you agree upon them and you implement them, and then you evaluate the best solution. You action plan it. Now, in theory, this is fantastic. In practice, it works sometimes. But you know, as a professional, as an adult, as a leader, it is our duty to resolve conflict, often conflict between parties, often uh, conflict between us and others. More often though, it's amongst our, our team, our staff, our colleagues our family, our friends. Kutsa is one model that's proven in the past to be very useful. A key to this to success of this model is focusing on the behavior, not the person. Confront the conflict. In other words, confront the behavior. Don't confront the person personality or character. It's the behavior we have to deal with. At the very heart of this is about the behavior of the other person. Now, of course, this links back to Batara's box at the beginning and then follows through. But you know, whatever you do, some people will be unhappy. And if the person you're in contact with or interact with has a problem with confronting or discussing or understanding or looking for a solution, just wants to act in free child or won't even engage with the situation, maybe as adaptive child and just says, yeah, whatever you want to do, I'll do it. Whatever you want, whatever you say, I'll just do it. Well, there's more to it than that because if we always approach situations from positions of power and authority. And of course, power is legitimate when it's used fairly and legitimately. But you know, there are certain responses that you're gonna get. And these are typical responses to overt power and dominance. And we see this a lot. If we feel that people are not treated fairly, 
if we see that people are not treated with dignity and respect, then there can be resistance. So let's just look at this model because it's very simple. It's just three words, but it is incredibly powerful because if we think about the way that the police interact with some black people, some police officers interact with some black and ethnic minority communities in the UK and in the US, as well as other countries too, there is this perspective, perception of overt power and dominance, of racism, of superiority. Well, how do people respond to that? Well, if you keep using power over people, there's only some, so much they're going to take. And we found this with the riots in the UK, and we're now finding this in the US with the shooting of George Floyd and others. Uh, not, sorry, the, the shooting of young black men in the US and the death of George Floyd. That some people will move away. They'll leave the country. In the UK, many people went back to the Caribbean or back to India, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Some of them will leave the area, leave the country, will move away. Maybe go up to Canada. Some, for many reasons, will acquiesce. It's a really interesting word. I believe I've spelt it correctly. Uh, I am very dyslexic, of course, so sometimes I make spelling mistakes on the slides and I apologize. But to acquiesce means to say yes, but to mean no. How many of you women have acquiesced to a male or fellow female request or advance or demand? Have you walked away? Have you acquiesced? If we think about the uh, Me Too movement, we've gone from the withdrawal, we've gone through the acquiescence in many cases, and now we're in the resistance phase. And that's why we get inner city riots. That's why we get people standing up and saying enough is enough. What we have to do as adults is try and recognize our use of power. And our power often comes in the, me in, in the form of our communication and our language. And we have to be really mindful that if people are not treated with dignity and respect, if we don't engage with people on the adult level, then there's a risk not only a risk that we'll lose good people through withdrawal, that people will only acquiesce for so long, and they'll resist. And that resist can often be damaging and it can be avoidable. If we think about our use of power, our use of dominance, our use of language, which is why language is so important. We have to treat people with dignity and respect. And that's not just our behavior, but how we greet them and how we speak to them. Responses to dominance, very simple, very powerful. Resistance often seen in the news media around things like Me Too, very powerful and overdue, but also in terms of over policing and under service, of course. Okay, there's a bonus because I've got uh, a couple of minutes left. We're going to have a final model, a final theory. We're down into our now last our last five minutes. Then you won't have to listen to me very much for the rest of today or maybe again. But here there is a key. There is a challenge for you and it's a challenge from me to you. And that is all of these theories and models today. Some of them will just be irrelevant to you. Many of them, many of you will find some of it interesting and want to learn more. Some of you will find it really, really interesting and follow up in emails with me. The most important thing to remember is that these are theories, they're models, they're ideas, they're concepts. They don't work in every situation. They don't work for everybody, but they're worth trying and exploring and practicing. And one of the things we should do is not think of ourselves as professionals, as having all the knowledge, all the answers, all the expertise, but rather as adults professional adults with knowledge, but as learning adults, as people willing and able to learn. So if you're going to put into practice Batara's box or, um, or uh, six categories of intervention, if you're going to put in place um, um, transaction analysis techniques and just try and think about, well, you're not going to get it right first time usually, and it takes practice. And so what I encourage you to do, and if you don't already do this, this is something I've been teaching police officers for uh, 21 years now. And it's something I was actually teaching before I became a formal teacher. But 
a police training sergeant and then a university teacher, is the importance of critical reflective practice. This is where we think about what we do rather than just act and move on to the next situation. Critical reflective practice is about thinking about how we communicated, thinking about how we interacted with others, thinking about how our uh, attempt at uh, intercultural uh, communication, uh, interprofessional communication, cross-cultural communication, how has it gone? And critically reflecting on it, not just saying, yeah, it was good or it was rubbish. It's much more than that. We should look deep. We should have critical depth and critical breadth. And one way of doing this is think about what happened and what were we thinking, what were we feeling, and evaluate it. What was good about the experience and what was bad about the experience? And what else could you make of the situation? What else could you have done? And then think about, okay, if this comes up again, how else am I going to, how am I going to do it differently? Rather than doing the Homer Simpson thing of making the same mistake over and over and over again, intelligent adults and professionals think not just about their actions, but their communication. And it's very important that you do this because if you demonstrate a willingness to do it and Cressida Dick, who is the current uh, commissioner of the Metropolitan Police um, actually introduced me to this after a, a serious firearms incident back in the uh, mid nineties. And she was brilliant at it before I'd even learned it. And she used it on a debrief with a, a group of us. If senior managers demonstrate a willingness to do this, if those in positions of authority and power use this, then actually we can get our teams to do it. And critical reflective practice can be powerful, not just for the individual, but for the team, the institution and the organization as well. And here's some questions that might help you to work through this um, reflective cycle. What happened? What did I do? What did others do? What went well? Why did it go? Not just what went well, but why did it go well? And what did not go well specifically? And why did it not go well? Maybe this is when you use others to help you with your um, uh, reflections. What could I do differently? Look for a range of options. What will I do differently? How will I do it differently? And what have I learned from this? And if we use this method in our interactions and our communications, it, you get into a habit of it and it's very useful. And the truth is after this session, after I finish talking with you, after I've introduced all of the guest speakers that I'm, uh, um, I've got the, the privilege and the pleasure of doing this afternoon, I will spend 10, 15 minutes reflecting on this session because it's important. So we cannot keep doing the same things over and over again and expecting the same outcome. And for me, critical reflection, and, and I, I don't know how you feel about it, but for me, critical reflection on our communication, on our actions and interactions with others, whether they be with senior or junior people or people on our peers, is critical reflection is a process of sending a message to our future selves not doing the Homer Simpson thing of making the same mistake over and over and over again. So in the final minute or two, I'd like you just to think about this. I've talked to you about all these models. I've given you all these theories. I've told you, I've given you examples of them and what they look like and an introduction. So, so what does all this mean? How does this fit together? And what is the relationship to cross-cultural communication? How does this all fit together and how might this help you? So this is where we go to the chat and I would like you just to think about maybe just a couple of comments. I've got one question on here already, which I'll come to. But how does this fit together and how does this help us to go forward? So I've got two minutes left and I would like you just to type a couple of comments, please. You've listened to me for nearly an hour. I would really like, there we are, you see my timer, my personal timer tells me two minutes left or just under. So tell me, how does this link together? How, what was the point of all of this? And how might this help you in the future? So I'd like you to put those things in the chat, please. And also, was it useful?
So whilst you're typing, I'm just going to answer one of the questions um, that was posted by, um, yeah, sorry, that's been posted here. And it says, how do you think uniforms affect communication and attitudes? And do you think the importance of uniforms will diminish in the future? Um, and the effect of, of uniforms on the ego state? Well, this is a great question. It really is. Uniforms are about a visible presence. And people expect certain things from people in uniform, you know? And so that's part of the behavior. If the behavior matches the attitude and the expectation and the professional acts in a way which is in the adult ego state, then absolutely, um, you know, the, the uniform, if the behavior matches the uniform, then you get legitimacy. But if the behavior does not match the expected um, behavior, if the behavior doesn't match what's expected of the, the uniform. So if the police officer um, is in uniform and um, is drinking on duty or maybe um, takes drugs or maybe um, assault somebody, then what they do is they, they diminish the legitimacy of the institution, the organization. I think people, um, even me now, after being wearing a uniform for most of my life, when I see a uniform, I, I, you know, I look up, I do. I, I, I think society does that. We're, 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 we're conditioned to do that. I think if you wear a uniform, there are certain expectations and demands made of you. And I do think, I do think that, that, that we who wear uniforms should set a very good example and should be good role models. And that means in terms of our communication. So it's not appropriate for someone on the ship to send a racist, sexist or homophobic text message to a colleague, even if they are of a, a equal or lower status. That is not appropriate communication. That is not appropriate behavior. And for me, procedural justice, procedural fairness, and, um, and, 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 prof and professionalism is, should be at the heart of everything we do, whether we are on or off duty. So that's my time up. There are some really interesting points being made, and I will work through those um, uh, later on today. And where appropriate, I'll come back to you. But thank you very much indeed for your uh, attention this afternoon. If you've got any questions, my email is andyhill at unuk.is. Very happy to take emails, questions, and follow up thoughts. Okay. So if you just bear with me for one moment, please. Okay, so I would like now to introduce our next guest speaker, who is Rear Admiral Joanna Noonan, who is Assistant Commandant for Human Resources at the US Coast Guard. And, and Joanne's going to talk about cross-cultural communication, policy, and personally. Joanna, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Andy. I'm trying to start my video, but mm -hmm. it says it has been disabled by the host. Okay, Thomas. Okay, we're just working on that at the moment. So, um, okay, there we go. Ah, yes, there you are, Johanna. Uniforms, I have worn my uniform today. <laughs> yes, very smart, I'm very impressed. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for the honor of addressing the Arctic Guardians Dialogue. This opportunity comes on the heels of my speaking in Iceland on World Maritime Day on the topic of women in the maritime industry. I was invited by an old Coast Guard Academy classmate, Iceland's Commodore Askrimmer Askrimson, to fly up for a beautiful visit. When he contacted me again about today, he explained that it's a very prestigious conference, but the occasion might be a little less glamorous. The whole thing is on Zoom. Therefore, I am holding out hope that somehow I've gotten a rain check. There will be a glamorous trip at some point, 
if I may be so bold, I'm going to urge that we, you, or some combination of our respective Arctic personnel get together as soon as the, this pandemic is over for meetings or a training exercise. If this pandemic has taught us anything, it's reminded us of the importance of working shoulder to shoulder and embracing our common cause. This is the point I have to make today. And it's one I plan to make in meetings with our senior leadership once the restrictions have lifted. We really have to get out and spread the sense of a shared mission. We have to get out and promote inclusion and cohesion. So here I go. If you were familiar with things in Washington, DC, you'd be saying to yourselves, here she goes again. I know by now when I show up at an event, everyone thinks, okay, here comes Noonan. She's going to talk about diversity and inclusion or cross-cultural communication because that's the flag she's always waving. The reactions can vary depending on the way the pendulum of American politics and culture swings. I wanna say, guys, what are you talking about? It's the mission. At various points, I've commanded a buoy tender in Alaska, the Hawaiian Islands sector, and the Great Lakes District. I am as salty a dog as any of you, except for, I'm sure, Dr. Hill. So I say, yeah, ship out there, fly the helicopters, let's go. Everybody get to work. But you'd better realize that the folks headed out are going to be black, white, brown, male, female, gay, straight. And it it's our job to turn them into a team. 40% of the cadets entering the Coast Guard Academy right now are women. But at the same time, a substantial portion of women officers are giving up their careers at the 10 or 15 year mark. We're also not recruiting or re retaining minority members as well as we should. African-Americans only make up 6% of the Coast Guard, which means we lag far behind the other services. Now, think of the other admirals here in Washington. The Coast Guard is going through a tremendous fleet modernization. We have new national security cutters and fast response cutters. New polar security cutters and offshore patrol cutters are on the way. Imagine if one of the admirals behind all of this said to the commandant, this is great, you know, of course, that in 10 years, 20% of all these ships will be done and out of service. Admiral Schultz would hit the ceiling. Congress would hit the ceiling they would wonder why are we paying for these if they don't last? Imagine if the Admiral in charge of cybersecurity said, we're not gonna go out of our way worrying about this last 15% of the network because everything else seems pretty good. The whole system would crash and burn. In human resources, that's what I'm working with every day. So I'm waving that diversity and inclusion or cross-cultural communication flag big time. The priority is the mission, but I'm trying to protect our most valuable resource, our people. Admiral Schultz can tell you that a great many cross-cultural policies are in effect throughout the Coast Guard, and several more are in development in my department. It is complicated business, but every so often we are reminded of its importance. On May 25th of last year, police in Minneapolis arrested 46-year-old George Floyd for attempting to pass a counterfeit bill. Cell phone video taken by onlookers showed three officers holding Floyd down. Floyd was black, the officer kneeling on his neck for an extended length of time as Floyd repeatedly said he couldn't breathe and as he begged please and even for his mama before he died was white. The video shocked the nation and the world. However, while protests formed in several cities, deafening silences prevailed at Coast Guard installations around the country. African-American service members were struggling with grief and frustration, just as much as African-Americans everywhere. Yet their white colleagues didn't know what to say or do. It was a moment that simply demanded decency. So the leadership had to send out messages spurring action. It is encouraged and it is necessary for white members to reach out to their black shipmates and say, you're sad to see what happened. You're sorry that it took so long for you to understand the world they're living in, that it's different from yours. Admiral Schultz's statement said that our core values of honor, respect, and devotion to duty demand that we forge a deeper understanding and appreciation for others' viewpoints and life experiences. This is cross-cultural communication, 
This is telling fellow service members that you understand and respect that they come from a different background. This is not just leadership using cross-cultural communication. It's our telling everyone in the Coast Guard, it's important that they use it. This brings us back to the mission and a very, very simple truth we must bear in mind. If we are going to demand a good faith effort from our people in search and rescue, law enforcement and national security, that in similar good faith, we must provide them a professional environment that is respectful and rewarding. When Commodore S. Grimson and I discussed the direction today's remarks would take, he explained that the makeup of Icelandic society, which had remained much the same for centuries, was changing very rapidly. I presume the same is true for many, if not all of your countries. World events, migration and immigration mean that people of differing races, cultures and experiences are now living inside the same borders. The word we use in the United States is diversity. We have a great diversity, a great variety of peoples packed in together. You might be discovering this diversity by accident if some of these new and different people are choosing to serve in your Coast Guard. You might be happy already that they're helping you reach your recruitment goals. In the States, even as politics and culture pushed for increased opportunities for women and racial and ethnic minorities, our Coast Guard needed these people. Nowadays, we need them more than ever since the population is changing. Having a diverse workforce is the only way we can accomplish the mission. Here's where I think the United States has a few lessons for anyone who might be new to diversity. We meant well, the Coast Guard, the entire military. When we open the doors for women and minorities, the problem is that we left these opportunities as open-ended enterprises. Good luck, we said, knock yourselves out. We should have known that human nature would take over. When different kinds of people wind up together, a lot of cultural and personal prejudices take over. We've learned a lot of lessons the hard way. If there's one message we want you to take from today's presentation it is this, establish your policies for a diverse and inclusive workforce as soon as possible. I'll define inclusive in a moment. 18 months ago, when I went to Iceland, the occasion was World Maritime Day. <clears throat> and the theme was empowering women at sea. They were trying to attract women to maritime service or industry. My old classmate, Commodore Scrimson, figured I had been successful so I could show up and be encouraging, which I was. I had some good stories, but then I hit them with this. The empowerment of women takes place at Coast Guard headquarters, in the Ministry of Transport building, and in the offices of private industry, in the official policies you adopt and enforce to recruit and retain women. This might have been a surprise to Commodore S. Grimson, but my message to the young women in attendance was yes, there are plenty of rewarding opportunities for them at sea, but they had to know that leadership understands these are not just open invitations. They are protections with rights. They are positions with rights and protections. In the United States, the Coast Guard had just received the results of the women's retention study. Remember, we had been losing a large number of women too early in their careers. In 2018, we commissioned the RAND Corporation, a global policy think tank, to undertake a comprehensive analysis on issues affecting women in the Coast Guard. We specifically asked for two things. That one, they identify the root causes for attrition of women, and two, they provide recommendations on how to address these problems. I shared some of the findings in Iceland. There was one, biased or discriminatory treatment, two, sexual assault and harassment, and three, concerns about pregnancy, children, and family life. I went into each of these quite a bit, although I did wonder ahead of time how these would go over. The women appreciated the message. It turns out the, that these American problems are pretty universal. It also turns out that these findings made for a lot of changes to old policy and a lot of writing new policy. In recent weeks, we've received preliminary findings from a similar report on underrepresented minorities. This too is by the Rand Corporation, yet it's a far more massive project. Among the findings are that minorities are more likely to feel that they have not received sufficient training for performance and advancement. They perceive that the system of investment is not fair and they desire a stronger mentorship program. 
Policymakers must assess the feedback and start creating change where necessary. Our guiding principle, like I said before, is that if we want our people to embrace the mission in good faith, then we must similarly provide a professional environment that is respectful and rewarding. As massive as this latest RAND study is, it's very technical with a great many specific findings that can help us adjust the nuts and bolts of particular policies. Really, however, we've been thinking about this. Shortly before becoming Commandant, Admiral Schultz directed that the United States Coast Guard make a comprehensive effort to change the culture throughout the service, from recruitment to leadership development to retention. A lot of very smart people went to work and they actually created a transcendent approach to doing business called the Diversity and Inclusion Action Plan. It would take hours to brief you on it fully. However, I can tell you today the same thing that I would tell the new Biden administration and the American people. There are no more powerful commitment or no more sweeping every form made to the welfare of a workforce. Here's the logic of it. When it comes to cross-cultural communication, if your organization is becoming more diverse, either because your population is changing or you're recruiting talent from numerous ethnic groups, then you must practice effective inclusion. A half-functioning diversity is the end. Effective and inclusion leadership is the means. Inclusion is creating an environment of equal participation and integration. All employees are invested in mission success because they feel valued and they feel like they belong. Inclusion is a skill that must be trained from the flag core all the way down to the newest recruits. Let me tell you about one particular part of the plan, which is the most important part. We have to train the everyday sailors at the stations and on the ships. One of the tools is case study discussions where people gather to talk about difficult subjects. Imagine a crew in the conference room at a station or on a ship's mess deck. A group leader would read about a Coast Guard member in a difficult situation and the group would work together to solve the problem. Imagine a ship pulls into port and a bunch of crew members go out on liberty. They walk into a bar and suddenly realize that the owner and the other customers don't like the black Coast Guard guy who's part of the group. They don't want him in there. It's unfair. It's the only place in town and it's your only night off. But what do you do? How about this scenario? A small boat station, a handful of male members have elected to ignore a new woman crew member because they've heard that saying the wrong thing could get them in big trouble. They've decided it's easier not to deal with her at all. Is that fair? Is that the mature way to handle things? what would be a better way to proceed? The idea is that the groups would hash this out in sharing opinions or their own stories. They would try to reach a consensus on how things could be better, how, how things could be better handled. The important thing is not that they agree. The important thing is that they realize they can disagree on issues of politics and race. They will come to understand that people from different circumstances will see issues differently but then they can all get back to work with no damage done. This type of training has to happen, just like driving the boats or flying the aircraft weekly or at least every two weeks. We believe that before long, our people will be able to respect their colleagues for who they are and where they come from. And they will be happy that the Coast Guard mission gives them common cause. That is cross-cultural communication. If we can get that to happen all over the Coast Guard, bit by bit, on a personal level, then we're on to something. Then we can tell you about the sweeping administrative genius of the Diversity and Inclusion Action Plan. I could go on and on about mentoring programs, barrier analytics, lines of effort, and cultural fluency. But that's just the technical stuff about getting people to give one another every consideration. If you'd like to see one of our RAND studies or our Diversity Inclusion Action Plan, we'd be happy to pass them along. This is where I came in. Glad to be part of a meeting in which we are all finding common cause. Soon here in Washington, I'm going to make a pitch to the flag Corps that once the pandemic has begun to lift and it's safe to travel again, we have to get out into the field. That's been happening to some degree, but especially after all this isolation, we have to get out among our people. Not that we have to provide inspiration and guidance. We just have to be there as people who are black, white, brown, male, female, gay, straight, drive the ships, 
fly the aircraft, work in the engine room and give the briefings. We just have to be there to validate a diverse workforce practicing inclusive leadership. Remember, my feeling also that featured speakers should be flown to the beautiful cities that host international conferences. It's much more fun when we're all in this together. In any case, thank you for the opportunities to speak to you today and to bring our important work to light. I look forward to your questions and hearing your perspectives. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Joanna. That was inspiring, as well as thought provoking and, uh, of course, very interesting. Equality and diversity, respect, I just go hand in hand with inclusion and cross cultural communication. And I think you made that point so very well. It's over to our guests now. We have uh, 10 minutes for questions and answers. Of course, you can use the Q&A function, which appears at the bottom of the screen. And you're very welcome to post any questions in there. But it's over to you. Do you have any questions that you would like to ask Joanna? Okay, just while those questions are, are being formulated, Joanna, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the, the, the idea of um, equality training and diversity training for current staff. I, I'm sure it's part of the curriculum for new members of the Co Coast Guard, but, but is there ongoing continuous uh, professional education around issues of equality and diversity during the, the the career or is it just all front loaded at the beginning thank you andy that's one of the things that we looked at and we when we looked at our just training program from the sessions all the way leadership training that you get along the way and, and other major training opportunities one of the things that we looked at is we were talking about to some degree diversity and inclusion but depending on the course we were using different language we it wasn't very cohesive so one of the things that we have actually have done is we're updating all of our training modules that deal with this at every step along the way. We're also giving these toolkits to units and commands because you know when I was in the field, my last tour, I was in the Great Lakes and I would go to visit these folks in the field and I would talk about this and, and all you know the people at the small boat stations would sort of look at me like, why are she talking to us about this? You know, we're not the recruiters. We don't bring in diverse people. It's not our fault if there's nobody here that, you know, is a minority or, or a woman. And, and it really, you know, wasn't until I kind of got to this job and I really started thinking about this idea of inclusion. And I realized we had not given the people at the stations and the units these tools or ways to talk about it. So we have actually been giving them toolkits of like how to have these difficult conversations. Um, we've done some videos that people can show that sort of explore some of these things. And in fact, one of the videos we did was exactly that first example that I brought out where it was, there was an actual African-American petty officer who had that exact experience. And, it was, and it's been really moving for people to see that because then it really hits you of what it means to feel included. And you don't have to be a woman and minority to have this feeling of showing up at a new unit and not feeling quite that you belong. So what are things that we should all be doing to create that sense of belonging? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, there are many theories on challenging culture and and one talks about doing it from the top down and others talk about doing it from the bottom up. But I think one of the most effective is to do it from the center as well as from the top and bottom. And that sounds exactly what you're doing. Um, I do have a question for you. Um, and it. Um, it is a fact that technology is changing our jobs an awful lot. Do you think there is a risk that a certain group within the Coast Guards will feel left out and will not be able to participate in work? Isn't it one of the perspectives on equality? Um, and I'm not 100% sure um, um, when you say uh, that certain groups within the Coast Guard will feel left out. Is that in, um, maybe I can just ask for clarification. Is that in terms of... I think I might know what they mean. If, yep. if uh, I'll, I'll just try for it because I know we're struggling with, with this right now. I'm sure everybody is. Is that during the pandemic we've gotten way better at teleworking, remote work. We gave people tools to go home, and as we're coming out of the pandemic, a lot of folks are like, 
why do I need to come back <laughs> for five days a week? And do I really need to be there? <clears throat> and obviously there's some jobs that we have in the Coast Guard where you 100% have to be there to fix the helicopter and drive the boat and all of those things. And one of the things I think we're all gonna be struggling with is we have to become excellent leaders for our whole workforce, for the people that are remote, for the people that are there, because I'll just say, we definitely in the Coast Guard have a strong personal preference, uh, preference for presence equals performance. But I think that we can't really operate like that anymore. And we have to you know, be able to keep everybody included, even if some people are virtual, we need to recognize performance is really what matters and find ways to keep people connected. So I 100% think that's a challenge. And uh, I think it's a big challenge that we're gonna have to really put a lot of effort into. So hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, absolutely. I can see that it does. So that's, uh, yeah, that's very good. Um, I'll just check, have we got any other questions in the Q&A? None there, okay. That's good, okay. Well, I think that's great. Unless we've got any final questions that want to come through. Okay, in that case then, I, um, oh. <clears throat> Forgive me, we do have one more question, Joanna. Um, okay. And I'll, I haven't read it through, I'll just read it as I see it. Uh, thinking about how the US is currently committed to improving diversity within the Coast Guard and the service and the service of choice initiative within the federal government for recruiting diverse and highly skilled workforce, is the Coast Guard better suited in some ways than other bodies? I mean, I, I think I think yes. I think because our mission is very uh, appealing to people when they learn about what we do in terms of the humanitarian mission, the law enforcement mission, the national security mission, it is really about serving others. So I think that's one of the things that people really enjoy about the Coast Guard is the mission and the other people attracted to the mission. But I'll tell you that there are barriers that we, you know, just recently we discovered a barrier that we had for a lot of women and minorities who enlist in the Coast Guard and don't qualify for many of our specialties. And I don't think we even realized that was an issue. We did, we did see that a lot of women and minorities were, uh, seemed to be attracted to administrative ratings. And I think we had the thought that maybe they didn't wanna be operational, but when we actually looked at the numbers, we realized that um, a lot of women and minorities did not qualify for our, our operational ratings. We realized we hadn't looked at those standards deeply in 35 years. And then when we looked at who got a waiver to go to these ratings and who did not, their performance was the same. So that is one of the things that we're gonna get after. And that's one of the things I think that we need to do There's, I would just say there was no intentionality of keeping people out, but we just didn't even look at it until recently. So that's an example of where I think we can do better, but I think our service is a great place for people to be. And we're really looking at a lot of things you know, in terms of um, you know, people having families and how to make those uh, situations easier for people to keep their career going. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great. That's, uh, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? That two years ago, before COVID, things were evolving, things were moving slowly. <clears throat> but COVID has had many negative impacts on our lives and on our services. But in, in some ways, it's been positive. It has forced us to think about things differently. And, 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 and I think that helps with inclusion on, on many levels. I think it can be very helpful. So absolutely, um, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, if we were in a room, I'm sure there would be a huge round of applause. Sadly, <laughs> uh, sadly, uh, in this is one environment where we, we, we can't do that. But Joanna, thank you for an inspiring, informative and incredibly interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. Okay, um, just before we go to the break, um, I've been asked if I'll share again my um, final slide. So I'm just gonna pop that up while I tell you what's gonna happen next. So I'm just going to share that with you. Okay, I hope you can uh, see that. Okay. Somebody asked me to put that up. Okay, what we're going to do now, uh, I think you've all earned, absolutely, especially listening to me for an hour, you have definitely all earned a coffee break. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the second part 
of the uh, workshop. And I hope you found um, the, 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 the sessions so far interesting and informative. I uh, just want to remind you of a couple of things, a couple of housekeeping things. There is at the bottom of your screen on the uh, on the um, Zoom teams, a uh, Zoom uh, screen, um, an option for Q and A, question and answers. Please feel free to make use of that for posting any questions you might have for our our speakers. If you're like me, you think of something and you want to ask it straight away, well, you can post it into the Q and A, which appears at the bottom of the screen, um, very near to the um, participants and chat, et cetera. That's where you should find it. Any problems, let us know in the chat. The second thing is we're, we're gonna have um, um, uh, one, two, three, four um, presentations this afternoon. And uh, as a break to what we've done already, we're gonna divide up the, the, the Q and A for each of them and, and combine them. And so what we'll have is 20 minute presentations for our, from our next four speakers. And then one of my colleagues is gonna take over and moderate um, a Q and A session where we bring together all four of this afternoon's speakers. So at the end of our, our, our speakers, uh, individual speakers, there won't be Q and A, but as I say, please feel free to use the Q and A option uh, on the bottom of the screen. Okay. So it gives me great deal pleasure to welcome and introduce to you Margaret Wilson. Uh, Margaret is an affiliate uh, associate professor at the University of Washington. And her talk this afternoon is all aboard history, equality and, and opportunity at sea. Over to you, Margaret. Thank you. We tend to define our history through our perceptions of our current created reality. This is true with the presence of women in maritime in history. The sea is often defined in our current societies as a male space. It is not a male space, it's a neutral space. But what is true is that at the present time, the culture of most maritime crews is masculine, is predominantly masculine. Because it is now, we tend to assume that it's always been that way. In most societies, there really isn't any documentation to tell us otherwise. But in Iceland, this is not the case. Because of its very strong literary history and connection to its literary, there is massive documentation in Iceland about the common people, uh, men and women. And through that, my research assistants and I were able to um, discover a great deal about women who went to sea. And this was also an earlier researcher found the same thing that during certainly the 17 and 1800s, a full third of the Icelandic fishing fleet were women, a full third. They were celebrated as strong rowers, as helmsmen, and also as captains. Um, many men, it wasn't so much your gender, it was your ability to go to sea that mattered. There were farmhands who didn't, men and women who didn't want to go to sea but they were, they had to. Um, it was, they didn't have the labor to make this kind of discrimination. Uh, first slide, please. This is a painting that was done in the late 1800s. Um, it's of the captain Haldor um, Oedstotter. Um, there are a couple of mistakes, it's a lovely painting, but a couple of mistakes. They, didn't have sails in Iceland until the latter part of the 1800s. Uh, Haldor was a captain in the mid 1700s. And another mistake is that she only took female crew. Uh, she had competitions with her brothers who also had, were captains of boats and they had mostly male crews. And apparently she pretty well always brought in the largest catches. Uh, next picture, next slide. 
this is a painting by the same painter, um, also from the late 1800s, of Captain Thurder Enesdotter, uh, who always wore trousers uh, on land and sea, uh, not to disguise herself as a man, but, but she thought it was it just worked better for her, more practical. Uh, she was celebrated as not only bringing in the largest catches, even of people who had larger boats than she captained, but also for her brilliant weather reading ability. It became uh, customary that if she went out, even if the weather looked crappy, other boats would follow her because they knew it was improved. If she decided to go in, even if it was just a small cloud on the horizon, the boats followed her because the weather would change. There are accounts of her doing daring rescues when nobody else would, of bringing boats to safety when nobody could. Um, so this is just two examples of the many, many in Icelandic history that counter this idea that the maritime was male. Um, there's also enough accounts, by the way, that one can make the determination in a country where thousands and thousands drowned in these little open rowboats that not a single female captain lost her crew. Uh, the change uh, occurred in Iceland about 1900 when they had what was for them their industrial revolution, when they had got motorized vessels. And that's when you had, they brought in more fish. So you had a division of labor. So you had the processing on shore, it was a wage labor and that was low wages, that was primarily women. And the boats at sea, which was mostly shares, were higher paid, and that was mostly men. It was entirely men at that time. Um, next slide. But women started to come in to working on the boats, these motorized vessels, um, in the 40s and 50s as cooks who also worked as deckhands and also as radio operators. And next slide, please. And in the 1960s, an increasing number of deckhands. And next slide, please. And in the 70s through the 90s and early 2000s, um, quite a few women coming on working mostly as deckhands. Um, for vessels over 20 tons, which is the registers ones, one can get the statistics, they were about 10 to 13% of the fleet. But because of the way maritime is assumed to be as the culture is male, they were sort of submerged. Their presence was never really particularly noticed, even though they were there. However, on the boats, there was an effect. If we look at, if we're looking at gender diversity, well, what kind of difference is that going to make? Is it going to make a difference to a crew? Um, two captains during that period consistently took two to four women on their boats because they said it improved the boat's culture and climate so much. They said four was better because then you actually get a real change. Um, they said, excuse me, they said it lessened aggression. They had fewer fights. They said the men worked better because they felt competitive with the women and they um, got more work done. The entire team was um, more efficient. And all over, they felt it made a much better working environment to have the women part of their crews. Um, there was one captain for quite a long period who hired half and half female and male crews, uh, seven men, seven women. I was able to talk to them and uh, him. And most of them had other sea experience. And they remembered this time on this particular boat as with nostalgia, actually. And one thing that was very common among their comments was that you tend people talk about the community on shore, this shore sea divide, and then people go to sea, they leave their community, their um, sort of isolated situation, and then they come back. Um, they talked about the fact that there was a community then at sea. They said it was just, they even used the word that they said it was like a large family. Um, they all said that they really loved it. Um, the captain talked about how there was much less aggression as well on this is one of the things he said it was very efficient. He also said they worked very well in times of danger. So he did that 
It was a very positive couple of marriages came from it. <laughs> so um, now I'd like to move from the Iceland example to one in my own backyard, if I could have the next slide. Just looking at the presence of women in the maritime, um, the geography of Western Washington, I live in Seattle, uh, is such that we have a lot of ferries. They hire in normal years, 2000 people at sea, um, taking care of the ferries and also have more um, taking care of the docking. They started bringing women on in 1975. Here you can see them looking very um, 1970s-esque. Uh, and now um, they have, the crews are 25% female. I at first thought that they had started a, an affirmative action program, but I was wrong, actually. It, what they did instead is they took away the blockages. They made it so that everything from recruitment to promotion, everything within it is all done on seniority. So you can't have some person saying, oh, I'm going to choose this person for promotion over this person. They take their certificates, they put in their hours and they see promotion. They can look it up in the computer, they know. Um, if I can see the next slide, please. Uh, this is for 2020, a very strange year. Uh, as we all know. <laughs> so their crews are half because they had to cut way, way, way back on all their, um, on, on, on all the vessels. Nobody was taking them, right? Um, but you can look at here, I can, you can just see the, um, the different positions that people have. So in thinking about this, um, I was looking at how they recruited, how they did retention, what's happening here. For recruitment, it's what's very important is they, and this is with, um, as Yona was talking about as well, for ethnic diversity that I'm not going to really touch on deeply here, but looking at gender diversity, they show women in active roles um, in all their materials. All their marketing materials is very inclusive so that when people see it, that is normalized in what they see and it's active, not passive roles. This is vital. In terms of retention, which is always an issue, um, the early women who started in the 1970s talked about how this issues of sexual harassment was really prominent when they were, there were only a few of them. And they themselves formed a group um, to uh, give themselves support, to give themselves more power, to go for legal action if they needed to, um, to work as a block together to address this issue. Interesting enough, they, they dissolved that uh, group in the early 2000s, not because it was ineffective, it was effective, but because with the increasing percentages of women on the cruise, they no longer needed it. Sexual harassment still occurs, but in the same way it does any other working environment. And so they could go to HR just the same as they would in any other situation. The culture had changed. That was really dramatic. Another big issue in terms of um, retention is balancing home and work life. So for that, there was a really big change that happened that everybody, man and woman, thinks is much better. This is a ferry, so it's different than the Coast Guard. They're going out every day and coming back, um, but I think it's indicative. They had it so that you stayed on in a set shift, you know, six hours off, six six hours on, six hours off, or eight hours on and off, and they stayed on the ship for a week at a time, and then they would go home. They changed that to making it a day job. You work a 12-hour shift, and then you go home. Everybody says this is a massive improvement because um, they they have much more connection with their home life. And it's pretty straightforward, and something that's easily done in a ferry system. If I can have the next slide. Um, this is actually looking at Iceland here. Because one of the things I have found in my research and other people find the same thing is that a big reason women leave their work at sea is when they have children, being as women tend to be our major caregivers. Um, in this Icelandic example, um, you, have, you see a big dip during the childbearing years 
Um, these statistics were compiled by Helga Trigvedotter, by the way. But um, there is a dip also for men, but um, it gets much, it, it's, it's not as deep. But you also see many more women percentage-wise coming in later um, as they get older, and they also stay longer, um, which is very interesting thing there. Um, in terms of that, uh, Washington for the United States has a very good family leave policy comparatively. But also a really important thing for them is um, seniority, which is the way they have their promotions, is not affected by family leave. This is really important. So it doesn't affect your promotional abilities. Um, next slide, please. Um, another vital aspect in terms of uh, changing a culture um, within the maritime and probably in most other things is having women in top management. Um, then if you have the women at the top management, people get used to seeing them taking those power roles. They also, their perspectives are very different when they're making changes. It's much more inclusive of women when you've got women at the top, it just, it normalized women in power and in terms of decisions and policies. Um, in Washington State Ferries, for the third time running, um, the director of the entire Washington State Ferries system is a woman, the um, port commander is a woman, the port engineer is a woman, a lot of the major um, management people are women. This is very important if you're gonna have a real change. Uh, next slide. Um, the other thing is having women within the entire working of the ship. Um, this is a full female um, engine team. The, that is actually broken up now through promotion. The chief engineer is now a staff engineer. The middle woman is now um, a, an assistant engineer. They've all, but they, because through promotion. Next slide. But the thing that is really important is a normalization of seeing women on the boats. Um, and this has happened on the car deck increasingly um, as officers on the upper decks, um, but your passengers are seeing women, they're getting used to it. Um, and people, women wanting jobs are thinking, oh, this is something I can do. Also on the docks, there are lots of women. So this is how you're seeing, of course, they have a long way to go. They want to go to 50%. Um, and, but, and they have lots of other things to address, of course. This is a constant thing. But it shows, um, and next slide, please. Also, in terms of management, you want women at the top in management. And of course, women commanders of the boats. Um, this year with COVID, quite a few people are going to be retiring out. I don't know, you know, I have to look at the computer, but those about 14 women who are um, first officers who will be progressing to be commanders, we'll see how many get in this year. So it just, it takes a will. It's, you're looking at a, um, a culture change and it takes a really determined will to do it. Um, so I'd like, this is just an example of how it is possible to do it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Margaret. That, again, an, another very interesting and thought provoking presentation. As I said uh, earlier on, the Q&A for each of our four uh, guest speakers this afternoon uh, will be conducted uh, together a, a little later on. So thank you very much indeed, Margaret. Our next presenter is uh, Steinem Endersdottir, uh, instructor at the Maritime Safety and Survival Training Centre in Iceland. And her presentation is entitled Being a Woman in a Man's Job. So Steinem, are you ready? I have one question, Andy. Yeah. Should I turn my camera off or should it be on? 
happy either way. It really is fine as long as you are, as I can see, you are presenting. Uh, no problem at all. I will see my screen now. I can see your screen very clearly. Women in Maritime. Okay, thank you. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Well, hello. My name is Damon, and this is me and my lecture. Uh, I started working with the Coast Guard 1997 uh, when they told, talked to me now a month ago and they asked me could you could you tell us about yourself and your how it was when you were working on the Coast Guard in the maritime and I thought it wasn't I don't have to talk about it it's it's just just something that I did. Um, I was born in 1979, uh, 1998. I finished a diver, per professional diver lessons with the Coast Guard. 2005, I finished the police academy. 2010, uh, BS in sport and health science. And as Andy told, I'm working today in Seibjörg with the Maritime Safety and Survival Training in Reykjavik. <clears throat> I'd like to ask a question. What is, what's, what is a man's job? Why are we always defining jobs as, as women? and man's job. When I was working in this lecture at home, my daughter, who is 10 years old, she told me, mom, why are you writing man's job? There are no such things as man's job. So maybe we are able to change, change the perspective, how people look at it. Mm. Do we have to have equal gender on, on the vessel? Like they say, said before, yeah, some say it's better to have equal gender. But why is it so hard? And I'm going to tell you a bit of my story. This is my experience. Worked with the Icelandic Coast Guard. I worked with the Icelandic police. I've teaching both sport and math. And today I'm working <coughs> in Maritime Safety and Survival Training Center. As you can see on that list, maybe I have never worked something called women's work. If you see it, it's probably men who, who used to work at least there. At the beginning, I'm born in Borgafjörður who which wasn't a big deal we had a big home my parents lived there with uh, cows and and sheep and they had six children all of us we had to do everything it didn't we weren't allowed to take the gender card and say no 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 i can't do it i'm a girl that wasn't available So when I was finishing the school of the age of 15, I was able to go on the Icelandic Coast Guard. They, they allowed children, at least you can see the, this picture, I'm just a child there, but you were able to take one trip with the Icelandic vessel, Icelandic Coast Guard vessel. Uh, I went with them for 18 days. After that time, I was sure that that was something I wanted to work on. I liked it. But I went home and I went to the school and did my things. But then in December for the year 1997, I got this call and they offered me 
to come and be a crew member on the vessel Teeth. And I decided to do that. So I started at the bottom, helping the, the chef, and then I started working on the deck. Um, most of the time, I was the only female on board, but sometimes there were two girls, me and another one. We had, I think at least I, I would like to say we had, there were no issues that there was a woman on board. I think it's probably because I'm a nice person and no one can't not like me. But also you can see if you start on a ship, you're 17 years old, you're just a child. And people, they are not mean to child, I'm sure. But in 1998, I decided to be at least apply for the, for the diver course that the Coast Guard was offering. When I told my captain I wanted to be a diver, he was surprised. Uh, first, he said, mm, no, I don't think you can do it. And I asked him, why? Well, you're so small. You can't dive and be that small. And I looked at the other crew members who was a diver and I told, yeah, what about him? He's just as small as I. Why can't I do it? And he said, yeah, maybe you can do it. Maybe, maybe not. And then a person with the company came to me and said, no, we can't allow you to apply this job. It's expensive. And why should we pay something for you? And you could quit or you could get pregnant. And I just looked at him and said, well, OK, at least I'm going to apply. You can think what you think, but I'm going to apply and I'm going to take the exams and we'll just talk when it's over. At, I think it was in yeah, October in 1999. I finished the course and I was the first Icelandic woman to achieve pro professional diver license. Uh, I didn't think it was something that people have had to talk to, but uh, the press put some notice in the in the paper, and people talk about it. And if you see this picture where we are six who finished the course, you can see I'm the smallest. Uh, I look like a ten year old, and of course people looked at me uh, on a big ship with with something wrong and the diver was coming and they looked at me, whoa, is this kid gonna help us? But if I prepared, put my hood on and then there was no problem. I just did my things. Uh, one of my, uh, one of the crew told me just to answer it. Well, the big ones, they use the muscle, the small ones, they use the brain. Uh, so, I worked on teeth for several years. I did everything. And at the time, you can see here a, a press where, where there was eight women in this, on the ship. Uh, there were these newbies. They were allowed to come, six girls for one, one train, one, one trip. And me and Linda, who worked in the Coast Guard, we are here on this side. So people thought, yeah, that's, that's going to be hard for us, the guys, to be on board. But maybe the guys can answer it. I don't think it was that terrible. <clears throat> when I was working in Tir, I got pregnant. Well, yeah, the captain was right. But that was many years later. And, and I went 
home. I I took a one year of license and then I started to work at the office. Uh, I didn't think I could go back on being a crew member on the vessel teeth. I, it didn't feel right to leave my child at home. So I decided to go to the Icelandic police. When I was working in the Coast Guard in 2001, I decided to try to work the next summer. I was able to get uh, some time off and I went to work as a police officer that year, 2002. Uh, I liked that, but at the time you had to have finished the academy. So I went back on TIR. And when I decide, when I was finishing my maternal lead, I decided to go into the policy academy and I finished it 2005. Um, you can see here it's, I'm, I'm there on my first day going to work and I've done a lot in the police. I've always worked in the front. Um, we had this girl team who went in a soccer or football cup. And in the police, they're always trying to get more women to work there. At least you can't say, oh, I can't work on shift because my children are alone home for 18 days. Uh, you can, I think we were six girls who finished the school 2005 and you can do everything. Uh, the police and the Coast Guard, they used to work together. They are training together and, and so I've always been with the one foot, if I can say so with the Icelandic Coast Guard. Mm. My ship is Tif. As I go back, this is my ship. And I only sailed that one when I was working with the Coast Guard. Uh, but when I was working as a police officer, I decided I had to become something more. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to, to just work as a police officer. So I decided to, to finish my BC in, in sport and science. While I was learning that, I worked with the police when I, on the weekends and, and the summers. And I finished the BS and I started to working as a teacher. Um, that was hard. So I decided to go back to the police. It's easier to work as a police officer than to be a teacher in the Icelandic schools. 2015, I had an accident on my shoulder. So I, after making a long story, long story short, I changed it, changed my career. And now I'm a teacher at the Maritime Safety and Survival Training Center, who is on board Cybjörg. And I started there 2016. When I talked to Hilmar, who is in charge of this school, I, I've always felt like I was welcome. And gender doesn't matter. Um, here in the school, I get all the support that I need. Uh, they, they try to encourage me to do more. Um, I learned EMT. They told me to go and be a medical emergency medical technical, uh, sorry. And 
I've worked also there. When I decided to put this lecture together, I put a lot of pictures. So you can see this is a normal day at work when COVID allowed us to do physical stuff. We teach fire. I teach fire. I take the guys who runs the biggest ship in Iceland and I teach them how to react. Never ever have I have I had uh, some sexual harassment or something like that. I also train safety for all the fishermen in Iceland. They come here and no one has told me that it's not good, you can't do it because of my gender. Maybe it's just because I'm a boring person if they do, but no. And so I think, but I'm sure that I can do anything regardless of my gender. I think we should allow people, we should allow the younger ones to choose if they like to choose it. We shouldn't try to tell our daughters, no, you shouldn't do this. You should do that, that's more girl. And I think that has changed. Uh, my experience is that the younger boys are likelier to, to be someone who says to you, but you can't do it, you're a girl, not the older ones. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe I've just been that lucky. But at least I know I'm, I have two minutes left, but I have said everything I wanted to say. Um, Andy, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Just give me a second. Yeah. Hello. Oh, hello. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, an interesting and varied career so far. Yeah. And of course, you're still very young, so the journey is, the, the, the end is yet to be written, as they say. Yeah. Maybe I will take your place. Hey, I'm, well, I... No, maybe, thank you. Well, maybe not for this discussion, but I am talking constantly. I am talking constantly of the need to replace people like me, old and retired police officers. Mm -hmm. We need the next generation. And that's not old men who retired, but that's the people who have served and have the academic qualifications to step in and take the programs forward. That's what we need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. We could talk for hours and- Thank you. Okay. And uh, there's some lovely comments coming in um, about your presentation, um, which is fantastic to see. Um, very interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Good. Okay. So let me just check the agenda. Remember everybody that um, if you have any questions or comments, um, please put them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And also remember that um, there will be a, uh, a women in maritime panelist, excuse me, panel session uh, later on this afternoon where you can put questions to uh, the, the participants. Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope you've had a chance and the opportunity to uh, top up drinks and freshen up, etc. Um, I don't know about where you are, but it is a glorious day here up in the northeast of Iceland today. I think it might be about five or six degrees above freezing, which is amazing. So, onward. So, our next uh, key speaker is Captain Lara Barrett. And Lara is the commanding officer of the CCGS uh, Terry Fox. Uh, with the Canadian from the Canadian Coast Guard. Lara, are you with us? Uh, yes, yes, I'm here. How do you read me? I'm having numerous technology issues today, but I'm hoping I'm coming through. Oh, absolutely, 100% perfectly clear. Lara, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thanks everyone for inviting me. I, um, I'm here uh, in St. John's, Newfoundland on board the uh, Coast Guard ship Terry Fox. 
the Terry Fox is an icebreaker and we do ice breaking around uh, Newfoundland and in the winter time and in the summertime we go up to Canada's Arctic and assist shipping with ice breaking duties up there. So that's where we are. Um, my apologies uh, again to uh, due to technical issues. Thomas is going to be flipping through my slides here. Um, you're going to find it would have been nice to be the first presenter, but uh, here we are. There's some repetition in my presentation. You'll see that uh, a lot of the women have we have the same ideas, same same concerns. So, anyways, uh, this is my story. And if you have any questions that are related to this, or are about something completely different. Please let me know in the Q&A session. I'm open to any questions. Uh, sometimes what I think is important isn't what people are interested in. Uh, so just let loose at the end. So uh, next slide there, please, Thomas. Okay, so just a little bit of history and I know other women have gone into it more. Um, you know, traditionally women, <clears throat> even though um, ships have been called she, uh, women were considered bad luck at sea. I personally was told at one point that the best place for me was on a dock, <laughs> not at sea. Um, it was uh, it was a hard go in the beginning. I've been sailing now for over 30 years, uh, but it's certainly getting much better now. But anyways, um, it was also hard to get respect for women and for me uh, at sea. And I could see this was most seen during the Exxon Valdez. Some people may uh, remember it's about a tanker that went aground in the uh, in Alaska and um, there is an enormous impact to the environment with a spill up there. <clears throat> One of the things that came out in the investigation uh, was that a female lookout was on the bridge at the time and cautioned the uh, officer of the watch about some navigational lights and buoys being uh, perhaps on the wrong side of the channel. Uh, she was pretty much negated. And I think now history sort of tells what happened after that. This um, problem of women not being respected in their, uh, at sea uh, kind of got overshadowed by the captain being impaired at the time. And I'm just disclaimer, I don't think it ever got proved that he, he was charged for being impaired, but not convicted. So just a little disclaimer there. Um, anyways, it was very difficult in the beginning to get credibility uh, at sea. Anyways, next slide. So these are some uh, little pie chart here, and this is Canadian Coast Guard only. It's it's not um, representative of what's going on everywhere. I was uh, very surprised to see here Rear Admiral Noonan say that uh, they're having a forty percent um, intake of women at sea. Uh, that was surprising to me because, as you see here, um, we started in 2005 and we had uh, like 8%, 8.5% women. And now, 15 years later, we're up to like 13.5%. So, an increase of 5% over 15 years. It's not uh, earth shattering or anything like that. We are creeping up there. But it's, it's, it's not the best. However, if you look at IMO, they uh, say there's 2% of women in the workforce. So we're doing much better than that. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is how it's broken down in uh, the Coast Guard. Again, Canadian Coast Guard only. Uh, if you look at the different departments, we have deck department, which is navigation officers and naval body seamen, engineering, uh, and logistics and logistics is our cooks and cleaners and financial administration support. We're making great progress in the logistics department. Uh, there's a lot of women in, that are interested in going to see in those positions. Uh, minor, a little bit of an increase in engineering, a bit more in deck. Not coming up in leaps and bounds. Um, but anyways, there is progress there to be seen. And um, uh, I was often asked, um, like I do these women in maritime meetings with some frequency and I was in one with Mia Hicks, who's a chief engineer on one of our, she's retired now, but she was a chief engineer on one of our ships. And she was asked, why do you think that um, there aren't more women at sea? And she said, and it stuck with me forever. It's just, they don't know how great a job it is. And I thought that is so true. Women of my generation, and I'm dating myself a bit, 
have been doing a really poor job of getting the message out there that this is a really good job and that anybody can do it. Uh, we have, we're not different than anybody else. Um, so my generation has done a really poor job of getting that message out there. And, uh, but there's hope because, uh, next slide, Thomas. The power of social media now is how I think this is gonna change for women uh, at sea. The younger generation is full on into social media. They're promoting um, themselves and their jobs. And it's not just women at sea, it's like all non-traditional female type jobs are being uh, promoted through social media. And um, I had a video I wanted to show you because I think Captain Kate McHugh, who's the captain of the Celebrity Edge is so, she has a huge following on social media and she's so witty and funny. Uh, but you can look it up, look it up herself. She's on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram, and she has quite the following. She has a cute way of how she uh, dealt with sexism or a sexist comment that she was receiving. So anyways, yeah, and on your own time there, you can look that up. Captain Kate McHugh, she's doing a really good job of promoting women at sea. Um, there's also a web page, uh, well, web page, social media page for women in maritime. It's called Women in Maritime, and that has a lot of followers, a lot of women promoting women. So this is amazing. One negative story on the other side is Captain Elsa Hadar. Um, you might have heard about her recently with the ship that went aground the Suez Canal. Um, it stopped traffic there for many days. And a story, a fake news story came out about that, that the first Egyptian woman captain was on board the Ever Given and it was her, pro it was her fault. So this is the downside of social media. A lot of people jumped on board with that. Uh, you know, women shouldn't, all the dinosaurs came out of the museum and started to say, yeah, women shouldn't be at sea, look what they do. But luckily, um, within a couple of days, the story got beaten down. She was nowhere near the Suez Canal at the time, was nowhere responsible for it. Um, so, you know, th there is still some stereotypes out there, uh, some negative behavior, negative feedback, and, uh, but that's all right. Uh, we're going to continue on. You're, we're not going to stop these two women here and you're not going to stop me and we're just going to carry on. Uh, anyways, next slide. Uh, okay, so the future and other women have already talked about this, the future of the Coast Guard. And in my opinion, I don't think it's going to be probable that there'll be 50-50 ever a women at sea. And I think that's fine because it's um, there's a worldwide shortage of mariners, and uh, it's it's just a job that's not exactly desirable to young people today. There's connectivity issues like I'm experiencing today. There's uh, you don't always have a link home, and um, so you have to be okay with that. You have to be very independent. You have to uh, you know it's, it's a different life, so that's okay. And and no, not having more women at sea, it's very similar to um, men not uh, driving or flocking to nursing. It's a career that doesn't really seem to attract men and the doors are open for them to join. There are some stereotypes happening there as well. Uh, it's just a job that doesn't appeal to them. So that's okay. Uh, anyways, what we, what we women, I think, need the most at sea is support from shore. And I know Cap, uh, Rear Admiral Noonan spoke to it. Um, the other woman that was um, associate professor there, she spoke to it as well, is where the women need most support is management ashore. And those are jobs like port state control, pilotage authorities, pilots, uh, inspection, inspection agencies, transportation safety boards, CEOs of uh, shipping companies. I'd really, really like to see more women moving into that position and driving change from ashore. And this also opens up doors, um, excuse me, many women have spoken to, once you have children, there's a lot of women don't wanna keep sailing. And the best, the ideal woman to go ashore in these management positions is a woman that's been sailing for a few years that knows life at sea and then can drive change for women at sea by shore through all these different agencies that I, I, um, I mentioned. Because when they start driving change ashore for women 
Um, it also affects men or any, anybody on board because women's rights are human rights and uh, what's good for women is good for everyone. Uh, everyone will benefit from that, I think. And uh, that's how it's gonna become seen as a, a more desirable job in general. And um, I think that women will feel more comfortable there when they're being supported ashore. My supervisor, my director is a woman. Um, and I think that she sees the human element more than many men do and that have been in a position before. Um, I'm not saying that all women think people first, but many more do, I think. And um, the other thing that women need I in the future and to support us at sea is support at home. Um, you don't, there was a feeling that you, once you had children that you had to leave sailing and that's not necessarily true now like I said here, a village raises a child. It doesn't have, just have to be the woman that raises the child. Um, their partner needs to step up as well. The village, the family, the friends can all also assist in raising children. Uh, women have gone back to sea and have young children. So it's absolutely possible to do it. Um, it needs definitely support ashore and you need support at home. And there's flexible schedules that pe women don't inquire about that they should be inquiring about. Like you don't have to come back full time. You can come back part time. Since there is a worldwide shortage of mariners, anything that women can do to help out would is generally appreciated with many companies. You can be on a relief schedule. So all these things are positive for women. Um, and the other message I wanted to talk to you about the, the future of women in sailing is I don't think women shouldn't feel intimidated by joining a ship with all men. I mean, I've had some negative experiences, but mostly they've been positive. I am where I am today because of men. Uh, I work in a male dominated industry and it was men that supported me. It was men that mentored me. It was men that took me under their wing, showed me everything, opened doors for me, pushed me, said I could do it. I had lots of mentors that were positive, positive influences. So I don't, I know there's a bit of a stigma that they're gonna be bullied or not supported. There's many men out here that are very supportive of women uh, at sea and they wanna see it and they wanna help us. Um, so don't lose the faith. And uh, anyways, it's not so bad at sea. So uh, that was the message really that I wanted to get out to everybody today. Uh, anyways, that's that's what I've got. Uh, I think the next slide is the uh, the end of it. Oh, no, I just one more thing. Yeah. Um, this is uh, Miss Ashley Monster. Within sailing, I just wanted to bring up, there is a, it did the slide about the deck department, engineering department, and uh, logistics department. There's been more women captains and more women chief engineers than there have been women bosons. Bosons was like the last glass ceiling uh, to be broken through. And that's just happened recently within the last couple of years that women have taken on the bosun position and the bosun is the most experienced person on deck. They are in charge of all the able-bodied seamen on deck. And this young woman um, uh, just recently became a bosun and uh, she's one of the very, very few uh, women bosuns on ships. There's a lot more women captains than and chiefs and engineers than there are bosuns. So I just wanted to do a shout out to all the women that are, are breaking that glass ceiling. So that's excellent. Uh, next slide, just probably the end. Yeah, that's it. So anyways, I'm looking forward to any questions you have uh, on my presentation or about anything else. Uh, please, I'll be standing by. Thanks everyone. Okay, Laura, thank you very much indeed. I'll just stop the clock. There we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't understand the bosun. I have to be honest with you. I, it's something I need to look up, what position that is and what the role function is all about. It's uh, completely news to me. Okay, um, we're actually ahead of schedule, which is no bad thing. So just bear with me a second, please. Okay. Inga, are you okay to start a little early? Inga, can I just check with you? Are you able to start a little early? Yes, I'm fine. 
Great. Well, in that case, then I will just introduce you. Give me a second. By the way, hang on a second. Uh, I'm going to ask the same thing. Ask him to drive the slides for me. OK, Thomas, yeah. are you there? Yes, absolutely. The presentation is ready. OK, perfect. In that case, then just bear with me one moment. OK, so I say we, we say thank you to Lara. And remember, any questions can be posted into the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. And there will be plenty of time for a moderated discussion with all of our um, women in maritime speakers uh, later on uh, at the end of this session. So our next speaker is uh, Inge van Ne Eilsdottir. Um, Eilsdottir. <laughs> I know, I try this name so often, Inge, I, and I fail, but I keep trying, and I will continue to try. Um, <laughs> and uh, you are uh, the second officer um, on the cargo vessel MS Salfos. And the title of your talk this afternoon is Present and Future for Youth in the Maritime Industry. And Inga, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> you. I'd like to have the first slide, please. Well, this was when the Navigation College of Iceland, Sjómann Skolin, was established where it is now, 1944. And there's a lot of proud in this building. There was top floor, there was sleeping quarters for students from the countryside and the third floor was for the decans and second for engine department and then cooking and some other stuff on the ground floor. Next floor, please. Yeah, this is unbelievable. It is 40 years since I was there finishing what we call Annanbeck second class. That gave me a possibility to be captain on fishing boats and a second hand a second officer on cargo vessel. Uh, to enter the school, we had to go for three years before we came, uh, two years before we came to the school, and to have a valid ticket as a navigation officer, we had to have worked for three years on vessels as a deckhand or bosun or something like that. As you see, there are about 15 teachers, 20 something. Uh, students who are finishing the third grade to allow them to be on cargo vessel and captains of the bigger vessel. And I'm somewhere there. Actually, we had his Aurora has another girl. And there was Skulina who was first finished the third one. And me as well. And the year after 82, I finished the third class. And if you see, it's a quite a lot of students. And we all had ready jobs avail available for us. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, this was traditional classes. We went for three days to sea with our captain, uh, teacher, and stayed on board of the Coast Guard vessel. And we did all kinds of training. Um, I think the one guy there in the middle, we are only two I left at sea now. Next slide, please. And on the other side is Skulina and me on the left side. We are celebrating both together when we finished. After that, there was not another girl for some years, but fortunately that has changed now. What I wanted to talk about when we finished all these young people, can I have the next slide? There is a plenty of work at sea. This is the union of Icelandic commercial fish own, uh, ships owner. All this vessel had jobs for us and I will pull and it's better to have the list on the next one. I stayed on one, two and three of this vessel. Next slide, please. See, that's the union. It's quite a long list. All this vessel had Icelandic crew. And either there were two or three in the bridge and two and three in the engine room. And of course, everybody, the biggest one, Aimskip was the oldest one. And that was on a routine normal. Everybody stayed there. They came home every two weeks and four weeks. And 
and the other hand, what you call a trump liner, that the smaller company, this one, Nescape, Vicuscape, Neshauer, that were vessels that were sailing for quite a long time. They could stay on board maybe for four or five months before ever coming to Icelandic port. That was, of course, not very popular by the family, men who had already family. But for us who like to travel, because we did stop in post in those days. You know, that was an opportunity to see the world differently, but we did a lot of things. Another thing, if you had a row or something, you didn't like it on board one of the best uh, companies, it is, there's a possibility to get a job with another company. And it's quite common that people on the routine vessel there that some problem misunderstanding the custom rules or how much alcohol they could bring home, they had a pause. So when they went back to the smaller companies. Uh, I found out when I was in the school that it was about one or two guys from every company working there. And when we finished, there was not a single man I remember having difficulty getting a job. It was not well paid really on cargo vessel. It meant if you worked long hours, you had good money. And we had 50 trawlers, stern trawlers at least in Iceland, a lots of fishing boats. So even there were 40, 50 students finishing the school every year, there is always plenty of work then. What has changed? Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, uh, sorry, I forgot. I was talking about part from the other vessel, the Research Institute, Havro. They had three vessels and they were sailing 250, 270 days at sea every year, most of them. And the Icelandic Coast Guard had three at least. And we had more ferries, of course, with better roads. We have on the fishing tunnel, we have closed down two ferries. And the government, they ran a coastal vessel that run around every small port around the country. That has stopped and the cargo is moved more or less with cars now. And all the things, all the boats, which I don't remember. But 83 or 4, there are about 700 commercial seamen working on the commercial fleet. It's much less now. Can I have the next date? Next? Yeah, one thing. Uh, I see those Iceland developing agency. We did man a research vessel in Namibia for a few years when we were teaching the locals to take over this vessel which we have done perfectly well. The Namibian do have nice crew and very well educated to run their own coastal vessels and research vessel. We exported the knowledge at that time. Can I have the next? Well, now this is one company Samskip owned by Icelandic and they serve all these ports as you see on the map. There are two vessels with Icelandic crew, the rest of man from somewhere else in the world. That's a quite a change. And with Amskip, the company I'm working, it's the same thing. They have four vessels. Can I have the next slide? And they run a lot of different country, connection with different shipping line and so on. The mining are there from everywhere. Eastern Europe a lot, Philippinian, Indian, whatever. I'm not saying that these seamen are worse or anything like that than Icelandic. The only thing that has changed that they get paid less salary, more or less, most of them. And what we have achieved, like I am now, I work half of the year, that two, uh, two officers 
in my position and we change every two weeks, every three weeks or five weeks because of the coronavirus now. But half of the year we are at home and that's very family friendly. When they are taking this long contracts like the people from Eastern Europe, they say for nine months normally. Well, I did it as well, but it was different that at that time. I could have a sure, you know, whenever I went, you know, to Brazil, Italy, Greece, America, we had a couple of days off most of the time, and we could see us around. Now I talked to men I was sailing with last year. He had been on vessel in the Mediterranean from one port to another for nine months, and he never ever put a foot ashore. That was before COVID. Just there was too much work and too many few crew members. But as another one said, an Indian guy to me, no, I don't have as much money as you do, but I have a nice life in India. And that's the status that is different. There's a plenty of seamless job everywhere. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, that's just for Aimscape. And another one. Yeah. That is what's relative to new. I do get email. I don't know why, from people who are asking for a job, asking me to consider if they could go the job. And almost always, this accepted many ways. It's nego, uh, how do you say it? Nego, they, are, they don't want, if it's, they want a job and they are not setting any limit, lower standard on what salary they are going to have. And fair enough, if they live in India or Filipino, they can have a nice life with much lower salary than we do here in Iceland. But I don't think it is fair. And what I'm concerned when you have just a contract for some company in Cyprus and you're working on a vessel in North Atlantic and you meet crew from wherever it is, it takes time to let them... Um, no one another because there's always too few people on vessel and communication is sometimes a problem and i'm not happy that you know the future i had 40 years ago and now when i'm almost finished and i look at the younger people who are looking for job well they're more difficult for them to get fair Salary, it's as simple as that. And I think I will let that go for now. I will not carry on. So thank you very much. Andy, is it my turn now to take, take the tiller? Absolutely, Niels. Um, I, with good grace, uh, thank our four guest speakers this afternoon. And I now hand the reins over to you, Niels. Thank you, Andy. Um, by the way, I think I saw somewhere that you, you, you served with the Thames Valley Police. Um, I don't remember coming across you when I was a student at Oxford in the 1990s, thankfully. Uh, yeah, I was there, but I don't remember your name on my list. <laughs> Being a law-abiding citizen. Of course. Um, well, good to see you, <clears throat> everyone. I'm Ian Zainerson. I'm director of the Stefan Zanatic Institute. I'm an anthropologist, social anthropologist by training. Um, I also come from a fishing family um, on the east coast of Iceland. My father was a fisherman, graduated from the Skippers Academy in 1948, sailed to the UK from Iceland during all the, the Second World War wars, and uh, saw to, to it that the Brits got their uh, fish with their chips. Uh, we didn't supply them with any chips, they had their own. 
but and so I'm, I'm very much I, I feel part and part of a, this uh, sea working culture that's my sort of upbringing and my my cultural background uh, so I'm very happy to be here and uh, it's 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 been wonderful to to listen to all these uh, all these six uh, six presentations um, very intelligent discussion uh, both from uh, theoretical as well as uh, the practitioner's point of view and when the, it, it is combined into a, a one in, into a whole it, it's it's absolutely it's a powerful it's a powerful discussion and dialogue um, I'm, I, I think the the concept of culture and the the idea of uh, role models is perhaps key to uh, to many of the things that uh, you have been discussing, uh, and and we have uh, role models for for most occupations uh, and most things we do in our everyday life. Um, is uh, if if you if you bear can bear with me a short story from uh, Iceland and Iceland the kindergarten. Um, when our uh, president Vigdís Finnbogadóttir, who had been, who was uh, the first democratically elected president in the world, I believe it was 19, 1980. Anyway, she had been president for a long time then. She, she went on for 16 years. Two, two children playing in the uh, sand bin and, and the boy <clears throat> says something like, when I'm, when I grow up, I, I want to become a president. Um, and the girl looks at, at him with very sad eyes and says, oh, I'm really, really sorry, you can't become a president, you're a boy. So it's just a, an example of uh, uh, not perhaps anything to do with uh, uh, seamanship or, or work at sea. But it's uh, it's it's a story which I think brings us to the importance of culture, and and role models. Um, Margaret, I think in your <clears throat> presentation you talked about the uh, masculinity of culture uh, at sea. Um, that uh, the the uh, sea culture, uh, fishing culture, maybe especially, is, is a masculine one. Um, what do you do? What do you do? You think that does to, for example, recruitment of uh, of young females to 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 fishing? I think it's. I mean, as with you, Niels, I got involved in what I'm doing because I grew up in a fishing community and worked at sea on fishing boats myself as a deckhand when I was younger. I think that's a vital, um, a vital perspective to bring to this kind of research. Um, and these other women who've spoken have huge amount more experience, amazing, wonderful experience. Of course, I think it makes it really hard. I mean, that's why I brought up just the ferry system. It's not fishing here in Washington state because um, it's just be having it normalized, seeing more women on the decks and up above, and as bosun, by the way, um, does make it something that women think they can do. That's, that's the problem. I mean, I talked to a lot of women in Iceland as well, and they talked about when they were kids, and I was told this too, that this is not something you can do as a woman. So you have to be someone who's going to be bullheaded. You're fighting against this... this um, this predominantly masculine repression in this case. So that's why it's so important that the culture changes and how that does it, I think is in, intrinsic to everything everybody's talking about now. I, when we're talking about the difference between private companies and uh, public companies, say here in the States, the ferries is a government where they make these policies. Um, I've also been, I was on a vessel here, which is also a ferry that goes a bit further here, a Canadian one, I'm afraid to say. Um, but I talked to a woman who was working um, in the food there about 
her ability to uh, be promoted. And she said, I keep to asking the, the guys at the top, I say, I want to be a deckhand. I want to go work at, and they say, oh no, you can't, you're a girl. So right now, I'm, that is still happening. So I think, I mean, the other women um, who are here are talking about ways to change this. Fishing, oh, I mean, Iceland. I mean, in Alaska, you're seeing a lot more women getting involved in fishing, including being captains. And that's then, there are many more small vessels when you have, um, I think that helps where there can be family. They're changing the fisheries there. I think when it's larger corporations, um, that, I mean, that women have talked about, it makes it much, much harder to get into it because they go to um, an unknown place and have to apply in a impersonal situation away from their home. Whereas it's, if it's integrated into their community, their entree is much um, better. And you were seeing much fewer women in Iceland now that there's, it's controlled much more by corporations. Whereas in Alaska, it's actually increasing where there's still a lot of that um, smaller scale family fisheries. No, the other women could probably have a lot to say about this as well. Yeah. Would you like to chip in? Um, any of you? Oh, well, let, let, let me just ask you one more thing, uh, Margaret. Um, obviously, there's, there's a lot of discussion about recruitment issues. Um, and and how that they are linked to the kind of governance, fisheries governance system, in terms of access. Um, so, uh, uh, for, for example, I, I'm, I'm sorry to have to go into the uh, nitty gritties of the Icelandic fisheries management system, uh, but but it's, it's it's not easy to go just to go and buy a boat and start fishing. Uh, the, the system uh, assumes that you have uh, that you control uh, fishing rights in the form of quotas, uh, unless you want to go uh, and for the limited uh, summer handline uh, fishing. Uh, but there's an issue there which I think is may create a barrier and obstacle to to everyone, not just just at women or, or young young women or. or uh, but but men as well, and that is that uh, you actually need some quite quite a number of months, uh, almost two years, I believe. I know that Steinen probably knows this better than I, but you need quite a lot of uh, sea miles under your belt uh, before you are allowed to actually go and take the uh, uh, the uh, thirty ton skippers. Uh, uh, exam for your, your for your captain's ticket. Um, so there are several obstacles, and it applies to uh, not just women but also to men. Um, are we are we over regulating the uh, the industry this way? I, I think I'd pass this on to Steiner or Ingefani, who have a lot more yep. experience in this than me, and they've taught at the Maritime School and at the Sandwich School. So what, what would either of you think? I mean, I think you're better equipped to answer this. Yes? You have to unmute yourself if you've muted yourself. Hi. Thanks. Uh, I'm not I'm asking my captain how many hours you need there that you, I think you need to sail around two years before you can yeah, be a captain good. on a on a bigger ship. But you can take the small one and you can start there with the, I'm not how sure how you call it in English, but in Icelandic <laughs> it's, it's punka pro, a balls test. It's for the small boat, 15 meters. But yeah, it, it is hard to get started if you don't know any, know anyone who can help you get started. So if you don't have the, the, the right background in terms of perhaps uh, a friendly family member or, or a father uh, who is a fisherman who takes, takes you with him, 
uh, and uh, signs the uh, the Days at Sea uh, declaration, uh, then uh, you probably won't be able to do this. If if I might just jump in here quickly. Um, so I, for my research in Iceland, I interviewed well over 200 women and quite a lot of men who had worked at sea in fisheries that mine was specifically toward fisheries um, at the time. And the women talk, they all had their, I got my first job story, every single one of them. And it was often that they coerced some skipper while they were all at the bar together. Um, often their father didn't want them to go. Uh, so they would, or they would sneak some way to get on the boat. That, um, in Alaska, I'm seeing that um, it's much more open at this point, but still it's through personal connections. That's why I think right now when you see a huge reduction of the number of women at sea, sadly enough, from even the early 2000s, is now you, I guess others are saying, you have to go to a corporation now. You have to leave your, it's hard enough already, but you have to leave your, your home, you have to pay for going. And um, this is a young woman. If we're looking at somebody who's 17, she's not gonna have that ability to get those sea hours because she has to apply to a big corporation who, where it's much, much harder. She doesn't have that personal connection. So that is blocking women out, unfortunately, in Iceland. In Alaska, you're seeing them increase and you still have the much more personal connection. I think we can do a comparison there actually. Um, I think there was mentioning of uh, uh, when when uh, women are part of the crew that there's less hostilities or less uh, even aggressivity. Uh, I think it's quite interesting. Uh, and uh, there are cases, there are studies, but I also, I also have practical experience of this as a fisherman myself, that in, in a dangerous and stressful situation, uh, anyone who can sort of relieve the tension in, by being with, with a, uh, for example, telling a joke, a, a, bringing a humorous uh, aspect to a situation which seems to be boiling over is like worth his or her worth in, 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 in gold. <laughs> um, Lara, can you, can you comment on this? Uh, yes. Um, well, I would say, yes, certainly a sense of humor is needed at sea. Um, and having women on board is um, definitely an asset for morale and for dynamics on board a ship. Uh, I know nobody's birthday would ever get celebrated on the ship if it wasn't for the women on board. They remember things like this. They put effort <laughs> into celebrating uh, people's birthdays or any special occasion. And the men appreciate it and they would never do that on their own. I know they would never do that on their own. Mm -hmm. So women do increase morale. I also think that it's a better dynamic in that uh, I don't think men and women are designed to be kept apart for long lengths of time. Um, men in actually enjoy, I think, talking to women and women enjoy talking to men. They have different perspectives. It's nice to have an adult conversation with different people with different ideas. And I think everyone appreciates that when you get together at the end of the day and, and talk about family and problems at home and all that kind of stuff that you need everyone's perspective. And so I would say, yes, it's um, as far as aggression, um, I don't know, maybe it calms people down a bit. Uh, I know that some men clean up their language when they're speaking to women on board. And I've also had mm -hmm. men tell me that they appreciate when the language is clean up because not every man likes vulgar language or profanity. Um, so I think both people have, are winning in that situation. Uh, I no, I think it's a, it's a good thing. Women do bring a lot to the morale and, and I don't know, life on board the ship. Inka Fanny, can you, can you add to this in hot pursuit? I'm not sure of what I would say about cleaning up the language. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, as I've always been the woman on board, so it can be quite harsh. But that, same with Lara, I do find men, they want to talk about the family and they come to me specially. And you talk about the kids and so on, they're not often 
talking about it to other men. They love to tell the stories to a woman about how they experience the life with the kids and so on. And they're sometimes very personal when they miss the family. So I think it's much better to have a mixed crew. And actually that's the best time I've been at sea when we were free on board the vessel or more women. For me, it was more fun and, you know, it was, as I say, more family-like and have more happy go lucky, you know, just when they're only men and I sometimes forget that I'm a woman. Oh, yes, lungs get foul. And, and of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stress involved in, in, uh, for the family as well, um, men being away, usually men, obviously, at, at least uh, in, 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 our, in our case. Um, and there are a lot of social, it seems, issues, even problems associated with the, the absence of, uh, of uh, the partner, of, of usually the man. Uh, and and uh, there are, there's quite interesting, interesting literature on family life of uh, fishermen uh, showing that uh, they tend to be, it tend, tends to lead to issues. So there are social risks involved uh, with, uh, with uh, going fishing uh, or being at sea. Uh, but, I, but I also want to mention to you and, and ask you to comment on uh, that uh, the, the issue of, of stigma uh, associated with uh, fishermen or fishing uh, as, a, as, a, as an occupational culture and, and seamanship in general, uh, that uh, these tend to be, uh, these people tend to be, and, and I'm basically talking about men, uh, uh, people who are uh, uncivilized and uh, drinking and brawling and uh, even violent, um, riff raff. Um, it, it's some, sometimes you see quite obviously portrayed in uh, a lot of popular culture, movies, uh, books, um, uh, songs, uh, that, uh, the, uh, that the, the life of the fisherman is, is not to be envied. And I wonder if, could that have something to do with the unwillingness of young people and I think, I think it also actually applies to the boys as well, uh, that they, they don't see uh, uh, work at sea as, as attractive. Niels, can yes. I just, I, I think this stigmatization, stigma is really important, but can I just jump in really quickly to say something? Um, when I was interviewing, this is from the female perspective, and when I was interviewing all these uh, women and families, um, women who went to sea, they all, they all kept, I kept, this is something I kept hearing again and again. I would never marry, I said, I would never marry a seaman. That's what they said. These are women who are going to sea. And they said, but somehow it happened. And they would all say, we didn't meet on the boat. That's quite important. They said, we met on shore. They didn't, so that was, but many of them took turns. They had families and they took turns. The man would go out for a shift and then the woman would go out. And they, so I had enough people who did that. That was quite a common pattern of those who did. And those family um, experiences, those as far as I could in the example that I had worked really well. Um, so they, it was something collaboratively they did between family and sea with both of them going rather than just one of them being absent, seemed to work much better in, in terms of the family dynamics and working through it. So just wanted to put that and throw that in. And the others could talk about the stigma, yeah. Okay, thanks. Anyone wants to add to that discussion? Stigmatization? Uh, yeah, well, I would say that um... There is a stigma against sailing in general. I spoke to it a bit. There's a worldwide shortage of sailors. It's just not attractive anymore. There's so many other jobs that are out there that are so much more attractive to people. People do have a, um, 
there's still a stigma around there that it's going to be rough and aggressive. It's just not true, but uh, it is out there. And there's so many other things for people to do that they, they don't have to go to see. So, yeah, I mean, the stigma is out there for, for men and for women. It's, it's certainly not just for women. It's failing mm -hmm. is just less attractive than it used to be for people. Um, and that's, that's the way it is right now anyways. Inga, did you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I think that's true. People don't see it as if, as, you know, adventure as, as my generation did. And mm -hmm. that's part of it because you are staying on board, no less, uh, no time ashore, and you don't get as much money when you go to fishing, when fishing boats, and when I did, I did for the first time when I was a lobster boat, I had almost 10 times more money than I was having ashore. It's not anymore like that. So that changes a lot. But I just want to say to Stein and Einarsdóttir about diving. I was officer on research vessel in Namibia and we were taking scientists to dive for researching lobster, rock lobsters. And there was one girl, she was 25 or six, she scared the hell out of me every time because we had to give them, say, I think it was 20, 20 30 minutes. And if they didn't come up, we have to start doing something. And every time this girl, she came 10 minutes after the last one before, she lasted so much longer. And she just told me, you know, just relax down there. Then there's no problem. And I said, I'm not relaxing it up. You stay 10 minutes more than the rest. <laughs> That was, she was much better diver than the guys. So I know female divers can be very good. Yeah, like they, if they are diving for explosives or something like that, they, they look better than the men because they can do pattern, but the guys go ring, 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 ring. <laughs> Don't follow the pa pattern. But just to tell you that you need three years to go uh, and be able to work on a larger ship. And if you want to be a captain, you need one more. So it's four years you need to sail before you can go. Um, if I could say something about the stigma and, and yep. the things that people think, when I started, I looked like a baby. I was a baby, but that was, the women of the man, they often told me, yeah, you can't sleep with my husband. They always, the gender, oh, there's a girl there. She probably wants the boy who is mine. So I thought that was hard, always telling them, no, no, I don't, I don't like him. <laughs> Not that way. So it's the same in the police. You work in shifts. You are together in cars. You can't go anything. You have to rely on each other. So we have to make sure it's, yeah, I think it's the younger men think that women aren't able to do the same thing they can do. That's my experience. Mine too. Yeah. And when they see you do the same as they, they often don't say anything just shut up and look the other way around. But we have to make sure that uh, the body, women and, and the man body, they aren't built the same way. Women can't do all the things that men can do and, and also the other way around. So together we are perfect. If we allow them to, to work together as they can, and, and be able to work together, but we have to trust each other. Yes, well, it, it's, uh, it's an advantage to have, if you don't have a big body, you have a good brain. I think you pointed out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that is the, the cultural identity of uh, fishermen and, and sea people, it tends to be enormously strong cultural identity, occupational identity. Um, and uh, maybe be because it's, it's people who have, uh, very often people who have gone through 
well, um, gone through experiences that are not available to landlubbers. Uh, they have uh, done things together that in, in, in faced danger and hardship. And uh, it's quite remarkable, for example, in, in the Icelandic language, where, by the way, uh, ships are not she, <laughs> Lara. <laughs> so it's not a universal. But, but anyway, um, but very often ships have a, a female name, but that's, uh, that can also work both ways. Um, but it, it's, it's with, with the cultural identity and, and the language as well, that in Icelandic, we have an enormous body of metaphors that relate to imagery, that relate to uh, seamanship, uh, fishing, uh, hardships at sea, and we use them uh, a great deal, uh, very often incorrectly, because people don't have that experience themselves. Uh, but it, it's interesting that uh, this, these metaphors seem to be like cultural root metaphors that people use in dangerous, in dangerous situations. For example, during the economic collapse of 2008, everyone was on a uh, lee shore and with the waves breaking and the ship sinking and, and, and all these things that go on uh, during a, 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 a heavy weather sailing. <laughs> um, so uh, these metaphors came out and, and prove that uh, at least some nations are very much at heart uh, seafaring nations. Um, but it's, uh, uh, I don't know whether you want to comment on that, but, um, and, and these metaphors were used by men and women alike. Now, I, if, I, if I can just uh, continue, um, we... I, I have think... one comment that I would like to say. Yes. Because of this. Uh, I wouldn't be here today if, if the gender matters. Uh, I don't like to get something because I'm a girl or a woman. I like to get it because I deserve it. Hmm. So I'm not very happy about this girls, boys talk, girls have to do this and that. And, and the society, like we live in Iceland, girls are allowed to do much more than the boys because they are trying to be girls. We have to take down the boys. Hmm. So I don't like, I wouldn't like on my ship to have 50% women if they didn't like to be there, if they were yeah. just there because they were women. Yeah. Sure. They wouldn't be good. The crew wouldn't be good if they didn't want to be there. Although don't most women you find who go to sea go because they really want to do it? I mean, I know that with the women I spoke with, that was a predominant thing that people talked about is their incredible love of the sea. They talked about being at sea and the seeing the, the animal life and the, just the joy of it. That was, that was a thread through everything. And that's why they wanted to go. I think in sense of what you're saying too, they went because they wanted to go. And the fact that they were a woman was something they knew they were, as one woman said, swimming, I was talking about these metaphors, they were swimming against the current, but they wanted to be there because they, they loved it. They talked about it, I loved it since I was a child. And so then I think, is in relationship to what Niels is talking about, I think is, is a change now that you don't see the people, the kids aren't playing on the docks so much or, or you know, was the culture changes. When I talked to, I did an interview with like 25 Metaschkole, um, upper high school students, and only one of them was thinking about going to sea. Um, and it was one girl and, three boys who'd had experience of this 25. So it was not, it, it is, um, they have different kinds of opportunities they're doing now. Um, but I think they, they've gone because they love it. I mean, Ingevani, you, Ingevani, all of you, I mean, I went to sea because I loved it when I was younger. Um, 
Well, you're absolutely right. That's exactly why we went to sea is, is for the love of the sea. I'm staying at sea now because it's it's an easy job. <laughs> it's your think, job most of the time. I think we have to wrap this up, uh, this uh, fine discussion. Uh, I just want to say a few things. Uh, and, and so um, just in terms of understanding these issues, uh, it's... Uh, uh, I, I think the the uh, solution has to do with sort of developing a culture that celebrates diversity and is free from discrimination and prejudice. I think that's very much a key to where we need to be heading. We need to change perceptions, behaviors, experiences, and then obviously we need to change reality. Now that's not a small task, but I think uh, the, uh, our discussion here has been a, a small step into that right direction. So I think, uh, I think we have come to a close. Um, I think we are about to talk. And, <laughs> uh, and thank you everyone for being here.